very important uh, academic discussion and yeah. i think uh, we have such excellent uh, faculty to help us to decipher the various facets of uh, the target controlled infusion and total intravenous anesthesia dr hemant is not available just now because and uh, dr this uh, yes, uh, sunil pandey will start okay no problem and uh, balasar and tushar why uh, mark will try to join by around 10 o'clock indian standard time uh, he has sent the i mean i've said uh, how to share it on the uh, forum so I, whenever it's time i can share his is it a, a good talk uh, you have on, sent him the link right nah? Yeah, yeah, he has the link. Yes, Mr. So, so he will, we will invite him last so that he can join at least. Uh, if he joins, then he can talk. Yeah, and, okay. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Now, the plan is, uh, Dr. Subramaniam, you will go first. We'll I'll go followed, first. Yeah, followed by Shiva Kumar. And then uh, we'll yes, give sir. it to Sishir and Dr. Deeraj. Uh, okay, and uh, Sishir again. And uh, then we'll go to Dr. Mark so that he's available throughout his uh, talk as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, sir. <laughs> I think once uh, the total intravenous anesthesia and target control infusion becomes a component of uh, every operating room, uh, the way we practice anesthesia will completely change. Uh, quite likely, sir. Quite likely. I mean, to say a uh, lot of different facets will come into our role. And, uh, uh, and also with the incorporation of the information that we get from the artificial intelligence in relation to uh, the use of TCI, I think uh, it's going to be very progressive every passing day and we'll be more precise uh, in what we do. And because the because all these uh, data can be uh, curated and we can come into better models and I think it will be excellent. Correct. Uh, the, well, what we call as a decision support systems will become even more uh, you know, pronounced and uh, decisions will be, uh, I mean, uh, we can extend the decision to even those who are, you know, uh, don't have normal physiology or, you know, uh, yeah. physiology expected to be very different scenarios. It could be trauma, it could be, you know, uh, cardiac patients. Uh, I see you. Welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Sunil Pandya. Welcome. Uh, good evening. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Uh, fine, thank you so fine. much. I couldn't join uh, <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Sushir. Welcome. Good evening, Dr. Bala. Good evening, all. How are you? Uh, I think uh, we have five minutes left. Uh, now we'll start sharp at 9 p.m. Yeah, sharp at 9 p.m. Yes. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Dr. Shiv Kumar. I think Dr. Shiv Kumar has come. Uh, no, she should came. No, no, Dr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, he's uh, not in the panelist thing. Uh, can I request Dr. Venkat to convert uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar MC into the panelist? Uh, yeah, just just did it, sir. Okay. Now this webinar is on live on Anastasia TV, Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, Dr. Shiv Kumar has come in. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome Dr. Shiv Kumar. And also I have great pleasure in welcoming a lot of our senior anesthesiologists. Good evening, Dr. Good, uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Shiv Kumar. Welcome. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, fine. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Rajan Daftri, sir. Nice to see you. Vijay Shetty, welcome. Good evening to all of you. I think it's going to be a learning experience with a lot of uh, senior anesthesiologists joining this program. I think it will be uh, kind of exchanging uh, more thoughts uh, and it's going to be a two-way learning process.
welcome uh, vandana mangal madam good evening to you ha ah, login kar do okay So we have about uh, two minutes to go. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Pandya, you will start, right? Okay. Something opening remarks and then introduction. uh dr deeraj uh, should be made a panelist uh, dr venkat yeah yes. he's joining he told me he's joining no no he's in the attendees uh, he has joined in the attendees link mm -hmm. uh, venkat can you make dr deeraj to join in the panelist done done Yeah, thank you. Okay, he came. I think we will start now. Right, it is exactly nine o'clock. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Sunil Panda, can you start it? Yes, sir. Yeah, I am ready. Uh, Sunil, bye. Hello. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, Hi, yes, Dr. Deeraj. Yeah. Hi, sir. How are you, sir? Ah, uh, fine. Welcome, Deeraj. Thank you. Um, yeah. We we'll request Dr. Sunil Pandya to start the session. डॉक्टर सुनील पांड्या सर सुनील भाई स्टार्ट सुनील भाई आई एम नॉट ऑडिबल Yeah, you are audible. Hello. You are audible. You are audible. Yeah, now it's audible, sir. I have been talking last two minutes. Not audible. No, 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 no it sir. was not no. audible. Not audible. Is so, it okay now? Am I audible yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. You are audible now. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all again. Uh, for those who have missed uh, my uh, audio signal was missed for a couple of minutes, but it's my pleasure to welcome you all for this fourth webinar. And this initiative was initiated uh, started by Dr. Tushar and Dr. Hemant Chinde. and dr bala venkat has been gracious enough to be the moderator for all these four sessions so today we are privileged to have this special session on tci tiva and we know that this is the end thing that is currently going on uh, in our practice and i feel uh, the lead experts in this field are in today's session so without uh, or much ado uh, let me introduce the moderator for today's session 
Dr. J. Bala Venkat Subramanyam. He needs no introduction. But uh, yes, I must, uh, I have a formality to introduce him. He is the Senior Consultant and Academic Director at Ganga Hospital, uh, uh, Department of Anesthesia, Periobatic Care and uh, uh, Medical Research at Ganga Hospital. And Ganga Hospital, we know it's uh, one of those holy centers, the fire center, which does the highest number of regional blocks and they train the highest or largest number of fellows in regional anesthesia and pain blocks. Uh, he has also been the immediate past president of Asia Oceania Society of Regional Anesthesia. Dr. Balavenkar Subramanyam is an education committee member of World Federation of Society of Anesthesia. He has uh, he was holding this post uh, uh, currently and he has been holding this since uh, the year 2020 and he'll be there until 2024 in the WFSA. He has been the national chairman of Regional Anesthesia of India, the associate editor of Journal of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, uh, he has been the governing council member of Indian Institute of Anesthesiologists uh, uh, and the section editor of our uh, prestigious journal of IJA, which has recently achieved a very high impact factor. He has been uh, the editorial board member of Journal of Anesthesia and uh, Research Pharmacology. And lastly, but not the least, he is the course director of Esquilap uh, Academy, which was uh, started as a research and education institute. I mean, initiative for again most of those freelance or consultant practitioners who wants or who are keen to learn regional anesthesia. And I must tell you and applaud that even two of my own colleagues have visited that center. And of course, I've been a regular faculty there. It's one of those, uh, I was the center pioneer center who does a lot of uh, pioneering research and breakthrough in uh, regional anesthesia. And yes, I must acknowledge that they were the first in the country to initiate the uh, level four uh, TIVA practice uh, uh, in anesthesia. Uh, again, uh, the other moderator, Tushar Chokshi, needs no introduction. He has been the one who has introduced uh, the Society of Tiva to the country, the Society of, of Opioid Free Anesthesia uh, for the country. And importantly, uh, being a, uh, not only a freelance anesthesiologist, but he also pursues highest academic interest. And you can see any Tiva webinar does not go without his presence and without his comments. He currently holds a position of a consultant in a private practice uh, uh, in uh, Gujarat, Vadodara as a freelance. But importantly, he is a visiting uh, faculty at Parul uh, and Savita Medical Colleges uh, at Eurocare Hospital in uh, Varoda. Uh, he also does a lot of ENT procedures at Dhwani ENT Hospital, the Sterling Hospitals, Urban Surgical Care. Uh, I must uh, tell you at this stage that he has received Naisura Award for the best infographics he has done more than about 150 infographics in uh, uh, local anesthesia and uh, uh, almost the entire uh, topics of anesthesia has been covered. Uh, and again, other pioneering research he has done is the telemedicine and virtual connect. And uh, he has incorporated AI and uh, the artificial engineering into the anesthetic practice. So that is uh, Dr. Tushar, uh, who has uh, been a, a great, great teacher and academician despite being a freelance anesthesiologist. In addition to this, today's workshop is a holds or today's webinar holds very important because we have the bright luminaries uh, from our country. Uh, to begin with, Dr. Shivakumar from Shimoga, you will have the introduction of the moderator. But Dr. Subhanir Mahakali, again, they are the again pioneers in uh, Tiva, Dr. Shishir from Bangalore and Dr. Dheeraj from Bangalore. Uh, and importantly, we have a very international, renowned international faculty Dr. Bar Mark Barley from Nottingham, UK, who will also share his experience. So, hold your bells, hold your breath. We are starting this great webinar, and I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Bala Venkatesh and Dr. Tusha Chokshi. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil Bhai, and uh, I am very delighted to uh, start with this session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed participants and distinguished speakers, I extend my warm welcome to this comprehensive webinar on target control, infusion, and total intravenous anesthesia. Today, we gather here to dwell into informative approach that has revolutionized the field of anesthesia delivery worldwide. TCI represents groundbreaking technique that offers precise control over a drug administration, ensuring optimal anesthesia levels tailored to individual patients. Its important cannot be observed overstated as it significantly enhances patient safety, it promotes faster recovery, and it enables anesthesiologists to achieve superior clinical outcomes. 
one of the key advantage of the tcit lies in the ability to utilize advanced technologies including pharmacokinetic models and sophisticated infusion systems by accurately predicting drug concentration in the patient's blood strip tcit empowers anesthesiologists to achieve a smoother induction and maintenance anesthesia minimizing side effects and maximizing patient's outcome and comfort furthermore tcit has gained Im- immense popularity worldwide due to its versatility and adaptability across various surgical specialty from cardiovascular to neurosurgery from pediatric to geriatric patient and tcit eva has showcased its efficiency in the wide range of the clinical settings as we gather here today it is essential to explore the current trends and advancement in the tcit eva with the integration of artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms and real time monitoring system the future of tiva tci tiva holds even greater promise these innovations aim to enhance patient safety optimizing drug combinations and further streamline the anesthesia delivery process moreover tci tiva has emerged as an indispensable tool in the era of personalized medicine by tailoring anesthesia management to each patient's unique characteristics and requirements tci tiva and she has a more individualized more individualized patient approach that maximizes patient's outcome and so satisfaction ladies and gentlemen this webinar provides unique platform for distinguished experts to share their knowledge expertise and insights on tcitiva though thought provoking presentation interactive discussion and case studies we will gain valuable perspectiveness on the latest advancement best practice and future direction of the tcitiva in conclusion tca tiva stands at the forefront of the modern anesthesia practice offering a transformative approach that optimizes patient's care safety and outcome today's webinar serves as a testament to our commitment to continue learning collaboration and innovation in the field of anesthesia let us embrace this remarkable opportunity to expand our knowledge foster meaningful connections and embark on a collective journey towards the future of tca tiva which sets the gold standard for the anesthesia delivery worldwide i am giving over to my learned friend dr bala venkat thank you so much uh, dr tucha chuksi for a lucid presentation about uh, target controlled infusion and tiva and uh, thanks to uh, dr sunil pandya sir for uh, giving the introductory remarks and uh, at the outset uh, i would like to thank uh, vocat for giving this platform to us and uh, anesthesia tv for sharing this across the globe i have uh, extended a very warm welcome to lot of senior colleagues who have joined uh, this webinar and uh, there are certain defining moments in anesthesia the inhalational agents as it progressed made a huge impact on way we practice anesthesia we moved from ether ethyl chloride triline halotain then to isoflurane to desflurane and sevoflurane every time a new product came in there was a progress in the way we dealt with our patients clinically and the advent of desflurane and sevoflurane marked a different defining moment with inhalational agents and it became very very easy to discharge the patient on the same day and day care anesthesia became extremely popular but inhalational agents had their own uh, limitations and uh, it became important that we also progress with the intravenous anesthetic agent the first textbook of intravenous anesthesia was published way back in 1935 by dr dandi who had mostly written about the thiopentone sodium now we have crossed several miles and we have entered a new era of uh, clinical practice with the evolution of total intravenous anesthesia and target controlled infusion personally we have been using it for the last 3 years and i feel it's an extremely beneficial tool for every anesthesiologist especially when we deal with musculoskeletal problems when you anticipate that uh, there is a chance of malignant hyperthermia and you don't want to have any trigger there and when we are using major reconstructive spine surgery when you want when we want to use the spinal cord monitoring with motor evoke potential it becomes imperative 
that we embark on a system uh, which gives us the kind of anesthesia that we would want it to thanks to the advent of uh, availability of monitoring this the bispectral index and a combination of target controlled infusion a combination with a regional anesthetic procedure has completely revolutionized the way we give anesthesia to our scoliosis surgery so with a with a four quadrant director spinae block with a target controlled infusion using propofol dexmedrolidin and uh, with this monitoring uh, keeping your uh, the bis between 40 to 45 we have evolved phenomenally and even after 5 to 6 hours of major reconstructive spine surgery at the end of the procedure we are able to tailor make the requirements and you see an awake patient that is such a joy to see no hangovers no nausea vomiting no malignant hyperthermia not polluting the theta and uh, i think the benefits are huge so to share the thoughts and i think it's become an it's become imperative that uh, all of us embark onto the journey of uh, embracing this technique and use it appropriately on a patient population to offer the benefit that it gives to the patient so we have a real experts who have been using tca for a long time and uh, let us hear from all of them and i also see lot of uh, senior uh, members of the our fraternity here and uh, i will be very happy that during the interactive session we will learn from each other and we will also know from their experience and expertise so with with this introduction uh, with this introductory remarks i would like to call upon the first speaker uh, of the day um, of this webinar uh, dr subramanya mahankali uh, dr subramanya mahankali is a senior consultant uh, anesthesiologist and uh, is currently uh, the lead anesthesiologist in aster rv hospital bangalore and uh, several achievements to his credit he has been the scientific chairman of the national conference of academy of regional anesthesia in 2015 held in bangalore He is member of the board of studies and in the executive committee of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India. He is a founder and the current president of TCA Tiva Group. He is an alumni of All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi, and uh, previously was the section editor of the JOACP Journal. Has more than twenty peer-reviewed articles and four textbook chapters. Has special interest in regional anesthesia, transplant anesthesia, Tiva TCI. and also very very keen to promote uh, uh, patient safety and education so uh, may i request uh, dr subramanyam mahankali to present on what do you mean by tiva what is meant by target controlled infusion what are the different kinds of the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic models we have and what are the new drugs that are in the pipeline uh, which will make tci more interesting Uh, may I request Dr. Subramanian Mankali to share his thoughts? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I I will uh, start sharing my screen. Is the screen coming, sir? Uh, <clears throat> am I audible? Uh, Yeah, you're audible, and the screen is coming. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian. Thank you, sir, for your for a very very uh, gentle and nice introduction. Um, uh, greetings to you all from Bangalore, uh, the uh, the so called Garden City, and now become a cyber city now. Uh, uh, gardens are a little bit difficult to find now. Uh, this is the place where I'm working currently now. Uh, I'm to share. I'll start sharing few things. How the things have gone, and uh, go into the details of the Tiva TCI. The first time I had my hand in propofol was way back in 1997, when Dr. G. P. Durreja uh, was one of the senior consultants there. He like, handed over me a milky medication to start using it. It was astonishing to see a white milky medication injecting into the vein, and it's working. The next astonishing moment for me was when I went to uh, UK in 2002 and started working in Royal Belfast Hospital. in which uh, the tci pump was already there and there was a consultant sitting there and told me i have been using tci for nearly 2 years now i'm talking about 2001 uh, in the last two decades or so 
so much of advances have happened and i just want to highlight what are those advances uh, you know this is seems to be the technology of the future so it's already there it we going to be bigger in future and let us see how it can play an everyday role and be our best friend for uh, providing anesthesia <clears throat> Now, uh, now, just uh, let me run through you a couple of scenarios yesterday. Just happened yesterday. You can look at the date there. It's date on uh, 11th. So this was a patient who was having an emergency section. A known patient of ITP had a plate count 12,000 when the decision for emergency LACS was made. In this case, we used a, a TCI target control infusion propofol for giving general anesthesia. The other case which I had to use was it was in a, 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 a pediatric bronchoscopy. Uh, where in which they were using endoscopic ultrasound through the esophagus and sometimes through the bronchus to take out the transbronchial node biopsy. So these are the two scenarios which I'm just mentioning you so that you get familiar with it. And and uh, almost every case wherever you are using IV anesthetic for induction can be used for uh, providing a full comprehensive anesthesia. Now, you may ask, why TCI? Now you just see how this patient wakes up and it's to you that I'm seeing the concentration, uh, estimating the estimated concentration there. And this patient is slowly obeying commands, not fidgeting, not fighting. And slowly you will see in the next minute or two, next right, half a second, right. that she will take out the LMA by her. And this is the quality of recovery you will get when you're using TIVA. Now, I know most of you are using TIVA, and a lot of you are using uh, by manual boluses. But you know, uh, there is always you know the, the the technology. The world seems to be moving very fast. What this person has said is, if you are one of those who is using intravenous agents uh, by manual bolus on a dose per kg basis, it's probably as old fashioned as administration of volatile agents by Shimmel Bush mask. In summary, in, in short. The way we give something, the way you give something is more important than the things what you give. Now, as I told, way back in 97, 98, we started using propofol and uh, the models had come, people had celebrated how to use it as an infusion for a complete intravenous anesthesia. So this was one of the first models which, which became very popular. And this was this came from uh, um, uh, Bristol, uh, Chris Roberts, and this regimen was fairly popular. We were using it only for selective cases where we were doing studies. For example, we had a huge uh, section of patients coming for, a, for surgery on the eye, that's squint surgery. And we were using this to reduce the intraocular pressure as well as do the nausea and vomiting, but in which the initial dose of 1 milligram per kg was given, then followed by infusion at 10 milligram per kg per hour for 10 minutes, and then reduce it to 8, then reduce it to 6 after 10 minutes each. And this was supposed to give a concentration of 3 microgram per ml. Remember this word, I'm telling you the concentration. We've always been used to concept of dose when we calculate milligram per kg. But this is the first time somebody had mentioned the concentration at, when we're using intravenous agents. We are very familiar with concentration because we use volatile agent as concentration. But when we talk about IV drugs, we had never used the concept of level of concentration. The least of the significant advance is that here you have a system which can deliver you the anesthetic wherein which you don't need to take calculate the dose. The dose is irrelevant here. There are more parameters than the 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 uh, what we call as body weight. And then multiple parameters are taken. You only select a target drug concentration. Remember the word drug concentration. We're talking of concentration in the plasma or in the brain. And the moment you decide that you decide what is the depth the concentration needed, by your and the machine will help you automatically decides what it, it infusion it has to give, what bolus it has to give, and how it has to change as the time progresses. That is what is target controlled infusion systems. We have come here. Because there's a lot of understanding has happened about how the drug behaves after injecting into the blood. Now, uh, we in the as a physician, we always understand that once you give drug into the blood, it's the elimination from the drug is important. But whereas in anesthesia, that concept is not so relevant because the patient wakes up, the effect disappears, or the effect you know, wanes because of redistribution of the drug. We knew that concept, but also slowly we started to develop concept, concept known as the uh, relationship between the concentration in the blood 
and the concentration in the brain and the concentration in the brain and to the effect how asleep the patient is slowly these sort of things develop and this led to the uh, evolution of tci and tci pumps and i'll slowly tell you the few concepts which have helped us understand and go deep and deliver significantly better anesthesia now the pumps have massively changed it is now a, what you can call a mature technology mature means ready to use fortunately in india when the technology comes in and it is at a mature stage people adopt it so rapidly so now this is a statistic from a few years back but a few years back 5 6 years back there were 5 million anesthetics were being given worldwide by tci ativa now how many of us are using tci as tci pumps we still are probably in hundreds but when india wakes up they will they will feel it feel it now now this is a very very you know interesting map which i uh, captured from the 2016 article now you can see the the world is divided into three three colors you know the green white and uh, red now white you can leave it because they are a bit behind in anesthesia so they are there they will be there but they are there but all those areas all those zones of uh, uh, the uh, map in green are places where the tci is being used and india is one of them unfortunately there is a bit of red in the most uh, one of the advanced countries there are several reasons straight we believe that for now but tci the most advanced technology or the current technology which is this futuristic is available in india and ready to use now also i want to draw your attention to this uh, uh, this national audit project which uh, which the royal college publishes every few years if you look at closely this in this this is a statistic between 2013 and 2021 in which the tva use has increased from 8% of the cases to 26% that means nearly more than one quarter of the patients who have been anesthetizing are give they are being provided total intravenous anesthesia by tci and processed eeg has uh, increased drastically and people's understanding of this has also got better now <clears throat> also you might have noticed that uh, the scotland has banned the use of one of the most popular anesthetic agent which we are using and england is already on the way all this might mean that we are left with a very very few armamentarium in our you know so called armamentarium so as a result we we are we, we, we in a condition situation where we have to learn we have to use it and probably in a sooner we will have that agent very less used among our community here as well <clears throat> now all along what we are also have developed is a significant uh, you know understanding of the basic pharmacology you know when when from the day one we enter anesthesia we get a very very good understanding of how the gases behave so we have understood that you now we have used lungs as a mechanism of delivery of medication into the blood and into the uh, into the uh, you know uh, circulation and as well as it reaches the brain and the equilibration process is very robust we have developed systems and circuits wherein which uh, the uh, the access is very very secure and we have a very very easy to dial uh, you know vaporizer wherein which you can set a maximum concentration and once you set it doesn't go up beyond that and also we have developed system wherein which you are uh, you are seeing the concentration of what is going in in what you are using end tidal monitoring and we all have learned what is what is meant by 1 mac what you, how many percentage is covered 1.2 max and so we have grown up with this and we have grown up with the concept every with uh, concentration in mind 1% etc but this was purely based on physical principles but when we came to you uh, know what is as a tva tci so we didn't have this mechanisms a few decades back now the uh, the iv access systems were not so advanced they were not so secure uh, and delivery system mechanisms were also not so good and uh, we didn't have an understanding uh, of the concentration levels because with the volatile agent we used talk about concentration here a dose and milligram per kg per hour we didn't have the concept of what is a target slowly the, we have developed understanding what is the target concentration required what is the concentration required in the plasma what is the concentration which uh, uh, how the brain works with that concentration how the brain goes to sleep and so much of advances have happened not only in the way we deliver the systems how these tci pumps have advanced we'll briefly touch it and uh, look at these things so so for, to in short what you can say is see there are so many 
advances have happened in the proper form uh, the formulations we also have a clarity and understanding of the mechanism of action i will touch a few of these and leave the rest to my other colleagues who is going to talk after me now now this molecule um, uh, is a very very popular molecule this is called 2 iso 26 diisopropyl phenol it's in some countries it is available over the counter in pharmacy as a as a pure form but if you look at closely it it is more like a you know a oil kind of solution wherein which it is not easy to inject but people did work very hard to make a formulation which can be easily administered to patients came for came in first i, have, I didn't I haven't had a chance to use it but it was faced with lot of issues with that so the current formulations people worked very hard and developed a formulation which is fairly easy to use and this is the current formulation what we have with a lipid emulsion but lot of research is happening in this wherein which nanoparticles are being micro particles are being done so these particles are being you know coming in near formulations which makes it easy and predictable to work and store shelf life is longer so lot of advances happening here in this in this domain what also is significant i want to catch your attention is you know uh, when people when especially when i was a, a student if somebody asked me how does your volatile anesthetic works i didn't have a single mechanism of action or a single drop but with fall an almost mechanism of action after fall how it puts to sleep is by potentiating your uh, potentiating the action of gaba at gaba a receptors this is fairly clear not only but also in in vivo mechanisms so it's clear that the mechanism of action of propofol is potentiating the action of gaba so that's a significant advance because when you know how it is acting you can understand how it interacts with various things various other medications various drugs all this can be you know in your uh, uh, it, you can understand you can uh, you can develop on it now what also in anesthesia which is very unique uh, compared to any other specialty is there is this on off paradigm what i mean is when patients and surgeons they expect us to give anesthesia within seconds that means the on effect of anesthesia has to come very quickly after they finish the surgery they want off effect very quickly so now this pharmacologically or pharmacokinetically it's a very very difficult concept no none of the other physicians have the concept of this on off because if somebody has a hypertension they'll start on a medication somebody has a, a diabetes they start on a medication the on effect will take a long time for us no it we want something which works very quickly and when we when we want to stop it patient should wake up very quickly so this involves a lot of detailed understanding of pharmacokinetics and lot of brains have gone into it and we have a slowly developed understanding of what it means for example in this graph you will see that after giving a bolus you can see the uh, if you give a, f- a single bolus the time to peak action is shown in different drugs remifentanil probably works in a matter of minutes the fentanyl will take around 3 to 5 minutes morphine it almost takes 15 20 minutes for the peak action so we know this is the one act of uh, one part of pharmacokinetics the time to act is very important for us now the next thing is if you are not using as a bolus if you're using as a infusion when do you achieve the steady state concentration again this is a very important concept for us because if when you're using steady state if you want to change it to one level to another level it should achieve quickly again you see drugs like remifentanil can achieve very quickly but as drugs like fentanyl it takes a uh, more than a few hours sometimes a day to achieve the steady state concentration so you will end up giving a lot of big boluses you can't start as a infusion very easily and predictability becomes better the other thing which is very very unique is you know we have all learned about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics pharmacokinetics we learn that how what the uh, what the body does to the drug so that is good but here we can zero in on what it means to us it what it means is after giving a dose what is happening to the concentration of the drug in the plasma right so over time what is happening to it how quickly it reaches the peak how it quickly how slowly it comes down what is also important is how what is the change in the concentration in the effect side that is in the brain so this can be understood by newer pharmacokinetics we have got a detailed understanding of this specific equations have been derived wherein we it is easy to understand especially if you involve a computer it is even more easier what is also and we have developed this understanding of what is the relationship between the effect side concentration and the actual effect what you see 
So that is the pharmacodynamics in action. It means what the drug is doing to the body. So instead of generally saying what is the drug doing to the body, we can here see it as the effect of the concentration on the what actually is affecting the effect side concentration to see what is the effect. So that is the fundamental difference what we have developed. So instead of deciding on the milligram per kg dosage, we have gone beyond that to understand what is the concentration level required, how the concentration level changes, and what is the relationship between effect side concentration and to effect. Now, what is also important is because we are using it as a, a infusion. We all need to know when the drug disappears. Or when, this is this we have understood the concept by known as context sensitive half time. It depends how long you have given the drug. And when you stop the infusion, what is the time it takes to reduce by 50%? Because we're using this medication for maybe half an hour, one hour, two hours. It is very important to get an understanding, get a data, what time it takes. Here, you can clearly see the remifentanil. When you stop the infusion, within five to eight minutes, the drug disappears. Propofol, in less than 30 minutes, it, is, it will completely disappears. So this is a very important concept for us because we are using a total intravenous anesthesia uh, for the entire duration of anesthesia. So no wonder if you see this diagram, for thiopentol or other drugs were not suitable, and propofol and fentanyl are is, is alfentanyl is probably the most suitable drug for giving total intravenous anesthesia. So, also the concept of you know three compartment model came in, wherein which we understood that the, uh, the moment if you keep giving drug into the central compartment, the most of it and you know, what happens is the terminal half life ignores. If you just look at terminal half life, it ignores what is happening with the redistribution. So in anesthesia. It is very important to understand what is the central compartment, what is getting redistributed, and the very, very minimal role of the, you know, uh, the terminal half-life or the, how it is excreted. It is more because of redistribution the patient wakes up. Now, uh, this concept is very important because uh, when it is a, one is to understand, other one is uh, when we, are, we have to decide how to, uh, to titrate the intuition, how to change the intuition, it becomes slightly get complex. So I'll give you an example here. For example, if you have a postgraduate who has just qualified, has come out, and he has, decides to buy a, a car. And in that, he goes to buy, he goes to, um, because he doesn't have money stored in the bank, he goes and asks for a loan from a bank. And the bank agrees to give you 5 lakh at 10%. Again, this, uh, uh, another uncle gives you a 1.5 lakh at 3% interest. And uh, somebody who is, uh, you know, uh, because you're just short of around uh, 0.5 lakh, you borrow from a uh, you know, money lender. So at 25%. Rate. But suppose you have only 10,000 or etc. to give every month. So how long it takes to uh, you know, clear the loan? It's not easy. Our mind gets confused. Similar sort of thing happens when we have to calculate by us, by ourselves, about how to change the intuition. Thankfully, the the uh, the all these PK models have been developed, but in which it makes it very simple to calculate what is the concentration required. It automatically decides how to change the rate of intuitions according to scenarios. <clears throat> Now, how it does is by using what is known as a bed scheme or a bolus elimination transfer scheme. Whenever a concentration has to be achieved, it tries to give an initial bolus and then calculate the infusion rate to, uh, to compensate for elimination and compensate for transfer. Now, what also has happened is a significant improvement in the generation of pumps has happened. Dr. Uh, Shishu Kumar will talk about this. And uh, a number of different models have come. The Marsh, Schneider, the Katarian Peat Fuser for the pediatric, uh, Minto, Jepson, for Remifentanil. All these have come. The models are there. And also, we have developed an understanding of what models to use in which population. And when we are using a particular model, do we have to target the plasma or the effect site? All these concepts have become very, very clear. So, and what is the advantage of using plasma targeting, effect set, all these are there. And also the parameters, when we use the model, what parameters it uses, it all helps us to understand, to titrate to a particular scenario. What it does essentially is that, you know, it helps us, you know, uh, what you know as a personalize the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the target what you're using. It is now so advanced that it is, you can use it for almost a, 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 a one day or child to 100 uh, years old patient and those who are being are uh, one kg patient to extremely morbidly obese or, or uh, no, uh, those with BMI upwards of 70. All these models mm. have been developed. And, uh, you have another two minutes. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. and, um, uh, and, and some of the models we have collected data from different sources to give us uh, a uh, model which can be used for almost any age group. 
And also, I just want to discuss a few concepts about uh, soft drugs. The newer drugs which are coming are, are called as soft drugs. What it means is the drugs, uh, if you're given at such a rate, so the body's capacity to metabolize is uh, massive. For example, if you are using remifentanil, the, the ability of the body to metabolize once you stop it is massive because it is metabolized by tissue esterases. Mm-hmm. We have used drugs in uh, like uh, Esmolol before. The drugs which can be rapidly metabolized, organ independent, they are the ones which are in the future. So this, these new drugs include, uh, no, uh, are called soft drugs. The newer drugs will include remimizolam, which is probably will be used as a, you know, a decay sedative, and also a few analogs of uh, etomerate are coming in line, which will be used as soft drugs. So, and the, the new gadgets which have come in place, which will help us personalize uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the TIVA technique for us. And instead of just looking at the waveform, we have understood how to look at the waveform, how to look at the number, what each number means, and when it is overdosed. All these concepts, my colleagues are going to talk to you, and there are a few apps which will help you. If you don't have a machine, these apps can help you in decision control and use it as a passive TIVA. So in, and there are newer technologies that are coming up in which which have an ability to measure end tidal propofol as well. It's a very interesting thing which has come out from uh, from Japan, but in which it is yet to be commercialized. But there is a possibility that we could measure the propofol coming out of the breath and use it as a, uh, you know, like just like how we use end tidal monitor. So uh, in short, so there are a lot of advantages happen in the in the TIVA domain, and uh, you will find some of it being highlighted here. And uh, uh, any questions, we will take it up at the end. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Subramanian Mahankali, for giving an overview of uh, the total intravenous anesthesia and target controlled infusion. Now, I think it's important for us to move on uh, to the next uh, topic, uh, which uh, we are going to deal with now. Um, and uh, I request for this. Um, um, Dr. Shivkumar. Uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar is currently the head department of anesthesia and a senior consultant at the Subaya Institute of Medical Sciences uh, at Shivamoga, Karnataka, and also he serves as the current honorary secretary of uh, the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists of Karnataka, and uh, he's done a lot of work in uh, target-controlled infusion. Uh, when we did the first uh, workshop uh, in Ganga Anesthesia Refrigerator, it is the same faculties uh, who did a great job uh, in deciphering uh, the various uh, facets of uh, target-controlled infusion. Uh, Dr. Kumar, we wanted you to share with us uh, a little bit about the pumps, and what are the how to practice TIVA safely? And uh, there are so many models available. The current uh, Arcomet uh, uh, pumps have almost 16 formulas which are available. So uh, can you also share with us uh, what? how do you take this forward clinically? Which one you choose? And what are the criteria for choosing an appropriate model to the given clinical situation. To explain more about this, may I request uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar to share his thoughts and ideas. Over to you, Dr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for an uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, can I see my uh, slides? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, good evening, all. I'll be uh, briefly uh, telling about a pumps. Uh, the development and guidelines of safe practice of a uh, total intravenous anesthesia and how I choose uh, uh, various TCA models for a particular patient. Uh, coming to pumps, we all know that uh, initially we used to use the profile through an intermediate bolus, then gradually then infusion uh, through IV bags or through directly from the bottles, then infusion through a, a syringe pumps. That is a fixed dose infusion through the syringe pumps. So there are certain disadvantages with respect to uh, these practices. Suppose if you use the intermittent bolus, what happens is there will be a peak, then the deer, then the peak, the deer. So initial part, there will be the target concentration will be less than the therapeutic range. So over a period of time, if you use the intermediate bolus for a longer duration, there will be accumulation, there will be the recovery will be delayed. So what happens when you use the uh, continuous fixed infusion? There will be initially, there will be a less concentration of drug because of a, a, a redistribution of these drugs into the various compartments. 
then gradually over a period of time there will be accumulation of these drugs so the delayed recovery so these are the problems with the intermittent as well as a continuous fixed infusions so to overcome this there is a price rubbers regime uh, already has been discussed by dr subramaniam so they started a, a certain a regime where initially the 1 mg per kg was given later uh, it, the 1 mg per kg was given to fill the v1 compartment that is central compartment later uh, 10 mg per kg per hour infusion for redistribution between a v1 to v2 that's a muscle rich compartment 8 mg per kg to uh, redistribution between v1 v2 and v1 v3 later the C, uh, 6 mg per kg was given for a elimination but the concentration achieved was fixed one is approximately it achieves in asa1 and asa2 patients around 3 mics in a lean patients suppose in a obese patient it varies concentration maybe it varies in a obese patient and elderly patients so this was also uh, it has associated with certain disadvantages so then comes the tsa pumps so we have to understand what are the tsa pumps so tsa pumps are not but a microprocessor with a pharmacokinetic software these are syringe pumps with a microprocessor with a pharmacokinetic software there are algorithm which are uh, studied and rebuilt uh, incorporated into this microprocessor so the infusion pump which can deliver up to 1200 ml per hour the visual and audi auditory safety system alarms will be available then it calculates every 10 seconds which is impossible in any other syringe pumps or a manual infusion the rates will be calculated every 10 seconds and it alters based on the pharmacokinetic and what is that set target we have set on the uh, uh, my uh, tsa pump so these tsa pumps are based on certain principles the that's main principle is a bet principle there is a bolus elimination and transfer principle the bolus to fill the initial bolus was given to fill the v1 compartment which varies with the model to model then elimination to compensate the elimination from the either from the liver or the from the renals then transfers between a v1 to v2 or v1 to v3 so to remember you just know that uh, chennai super kings there was a problem that is called uh, we have bet uh, betting problem so easily you can remember that's a bet technique so bolus elimination and transfer so you can see this this effect site targeting model initially the bolus which overshoots the um, plasma concentration gradually then it came back to the almost equilibrate with the plasma concentration so the red uh, circle which uh, say that this equilibration between the plasma concentration and the effect site concentration so coming to a target control infusion pump then the first generation pumps which were uh, selected to a particular set of patients the asa1 and asa2 patient even in obese patients what happens is these uh, is the models which were studied in asa1 and asa2 two patients were extrapolated into obese and elderly patients so you so there are there were associated with certain disadvantages so then the recent model has come which we actually we are the first one to introduce in a garc 2022 that is a elevated model so the elevated model can be used from a neonate to a, a under year old person from a, a 0.5 kg to a more than 200 kg so then third is a closed loop automated tsa this had to introduced in a, a india where uh, the tsa pump will integrated with the depth of anesthesia and a, a pain monitoring system where pain and depth of anesthesia monitor will give a input to the tsa pump so it will tell whether the increase the target concentration or decrease the target concentration this is the one which has uh, integrated uh, by arcomet and a dragger machine where they have inc uh, incorporated the tsa machine along with the dragger machine uh, so that the it will deliver the amount of a drug which will be required for a patient based on the depth of anesthesia monitoring which is not yet available in india so coming to a, a safe practice of a, a total intravenous anesthesia we know that this is simple the target control infusion is a simple you set a target and just leave it but there are a problem you know the tesla this a you uh, automated vehicle this autopilot failure then there is a problem you have to understand the safety guidelines what is the pharmacokinetic what are the other safety things we have to uh, understand the safety guidelines before uh, uh, practicing the tsa so there are certain safety guidelines uh, which are Shukumar, established uh, 
your Bye. slides uh, uh, hello your slides have, your slides are not moving or uh, it's moving uh, hello can you see now ah yeah 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 can you see yeah now we can see yes yes, yes. sorry for that okay there are certain safety guidelines which are formulated by society for intravenous anesthesia the secretary of society for intravenous anesthesia will be a, one of the panelists today and in association with association of anesthetists they have formulated a certain guidelines the recommendation one uh, can you see sir the guide yeah, no, yeah, uh, this yes yes okay recommendation one says all anesthetists should be trained and competent in the delivery of a total intravenous anesthesia this is one of the thing which is ignored during the training period so uh, this is the most important thing the all the anesthetists should be trained and competent in the delivery of a total intravenous anesthesia the schools of anesthesia and training body should provide a teaching training and practical experience in total intravenous anesthesia so you know that fifth national audit project and on accident awareness during general anesthesia found that self reported cases of awareness were more common during a total intravenous anesthesia especially when the total intravenous anesthesia were combined with the neuromuscular blocking agents you know the commonest causing uh, contributory cause this is the inadequate education and training in a total intravenous anesthesia so training is a very important aspect as the recommendation to when a general anesthesia use main is maintained with a profile infusion use a target control infusion so if you use the intermittent bolus if you use the fixed dose infusion there are a problem so whenever using the general anesthesia with a profile use a target control infusion why i already told because intermittent bolus there may be a overdosing or underdosing even with the continuous infusion there may be a chance of a fixed continuous infusion there may be chance of underdosing and overdosing okay uh, recommendations 3 the starting a target concentration should be chosen depending on the patient characteristics this is a very important and also co administration drug and a clinical situation suppose in a patients with a obese patients older uh, older patient frail and unwell patients you have to start with a lower concentration then you have to increase in a step ladder pattern depending on the hemodynamic stability as well as a depth of anesthesia because most of the old uh, older or frail patients require lesser concentration as compared to the young fit patients the recommendation for they have recommend delivered model in your machine then you can use the mosh model with a corrected body weight corrected body weight is ideal body weight plus there is a correction factor 0.5 multiplied by a, a total body weight minus a ideal body weight that is a, a corrected body weight in a geriatric patient elevated with a step ladder increment is ideal uh, choosing the right induction target drug concentration for a patient how to choose at high, uh, how much uh, concentration is required is based on the loss of concentration drug concentration achieved should be sufficient to produce a loss of concentration prevent a movement in response to the painful stimulus and careful balance is required as too high of a concentration can result in a serious hemodynamic side effects like hypotension and delayed recovery from the anesthesia so starting concentration should be chosen depending on the three characteristics that is a patient characteristic co administration drugs and clinical situation Uh, so uh, how to choose a right induction dose for adults the profile usually 4 to 6 in a asa1 and asa2 uh, is sufficient for a generally fit and well uh, patient using a snider i program my induction dose concentration to the bolus dose i would usually give when manually administering this will appear on your tiva pump screen when programming your concentration dose for elderly or critically unwell patient is wise to start with a very low concentration suppose i start with a 1 mix then gradually increase to a, a concentration which is sufficient to maintain the sufficient depth of anesthesia based on the surgery and we also look into the hemodynamic characteristic of a patient if there is a, a fall in the blood pressure and um, if still the depth of anesthesia is not reached you have to start the vasopressor then you have to increase the dose otherwise um, if you keep a very low concentration Uh, because of uh, there is a fall in the blood pressure patient may be aware so you have to consider all those factors when you are starting a tcty in elderly and critically ill patients 
So maintenance dose is influenced by magnitude of surgical stimulus, co-administered drugs, and patient characteristics. Example, higher doses are required in anxious and patient and lower in a older, frail, and unwell patients. How to choose a right maintenance dose? Typically, in a profile TSA model, 3 to 6 microgram is sufficient without opiates, uh, 2 to 4 micrograms with the opiates. Uh, otherwise, if you have a depth of anesthesia monitor, monitor you maintain BIS or entropy around 40 to 60. Usually, we maintain around 40 to 45 uh, for a anesthesia and 60 to 80, around 60 or, or 70 for a sedation. So, how to, uh, if you don't have a depth of anesthesia, how to assess the uh, correct concentration? One is loss of cons uh, con you observe the loss of consciousness when you are giving a, a induction dose. So then loss of response to a painful stimulus. This can be assessed by determining the this can be assessed helpful in a uh, determining the maintenance of concentration. How to assess the pain? Uh, how to give a painful stimulus? Just give a jaw thrust while inducing the patient that uh, if the patient, patient does not respond to a jaw thrust, it means that uh, a pa patient is have an adequate depth of anesthesia. You have a other clinical signs of awareness, you assess those things also. If you have a depth of anesthesia monitoring, use the depth of anesthesia monitoring. So coming to a profile and remifentanil, remifentanil usually decreases the profile uh, requirement by 50%. However, remember, remifentanil is still an analgesic and profile is still hypnotic and it's important not to confuse between the uh, two, particularly at the induction time. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is this is done yesterday actually. Um, this is a, a 56 year, uh, 46 year old female with a 56 kg, 155 centimeter. When the patient came into the OR room, uh, I just set a target concentration of 0.3 before say, uh, getting ready for other things, uh, putting a monitor and everything. Then I started a 0.3 micron. Patient will be it acts as anxiolytic. Patient will be calm and it will not affect a, a respiratory system or anything. You can see the I have set a, a concentration of 0.3. You can see that the BIS is uh, values around 97. Then I was ready for a, a induction. I set a concentration of four mics. So you can see here. Then depth of anesthesia is you see the BIS. It has fallen to a 29. So the, what I did next is then I reduced the concentration to three microgram. Here you can see that the concentration to three micrograms. The depth has come to a so this patient with the depth of anesthesia monitor, I would have given a four four to three microgram. At the end of surgery, I have set a target to a zero. Effect side concentration. Patient was awake. I uh, have given the reversal that is Sugamdex. I used the uh, rocuronium for a single dose rocuronium 50 milligrams. I given uh, Sugamdex for a reversal. Then, along with that, I have given magnesium sulfate, paracetamol, uh, then Dexona also. Then, a tab block, subcostal tab block, along with the rectal sheath block. At the end of surgery, patient was sitting on the table you can see the patient is sitting on table and ready to walk from ot or to a post post anesthesia care unit to summarize anesthetist using a tva should have a knowledge of the principles behind achieving and getting the appropriate plasma and brain concentration of iv anesthetic agents factors determ determinations response Practical aspects involved in ensuring the intended dose of a drug delivered to the patient and monitoring the patient receiving a total intravenous anesthesia, including the use and interpretation of a process EEG monitor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you so Hello, much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Shiv Kumar, for taking through the journey of uh, how you induce a patient and uh, which model you choose, what are the various models that are available. And I think uh, you gave an insight into that. And uh, actually, we have with us um, we have with us today um, uh, Dr. Mark Barley a consultant anesthetist in Nottingham University Hospital. He's also the honorary secretary of Society of Intravenous Anesthesia. 
He is the RV lead for the trust and the equipment lead for Queen's Medical Center. His clinical interests are difficult airway management, TIVA TCI, and advanced monitoring techniques. He has expertise in anesthesia for major head and neck cancer surgery, upper GI, and emergency and trauma anesthesia. Processed EEG has been a routine part of his practice for more than 17 years with expertise with a wide range of devices. Mark has spoken regarding processed EEG and TIVA at a number of national and international conferences, as well as organizing the very popular the PEEG seminars at the SIVA annual scientific meeting. So it's indeed a pleasure to have uh, uh, Mark with us today to, sh to share with us um, what's happening in UK and what are the progresses that uh, he notices in TIVA and TCI. Uh, and uh, over to Dr. Mark and thanks for joining with us. Well, good evening, everybody. I do hope you can hear me and uh, do uh, drop me a message if there's any problems with the sound or the video. Now, I've been asked to speak to you this evening about how I can ensure that my patient is asleep. I think a better term would be to say how I can ensure that my patient is anaesthetized, as of course our patient aunts aren't actually asleep at all, are they? They're anaesthetized. So we're going to have a look at the differences. Before that, let's quickly have a think about how things have changed in the UK over the last 10 years or so with regards to TIVA and processed EEG. This is where I work. This is the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham, one of three hospitals. We have 1,600 beds, 60 operating theatres and perform around 57,000 anaesthetics a year. When I became a consultant in 2010, this is the number of BIS monitor sensors we used a year, about 150 there or thereabouts. You can see the blue lines in this chart indicating the rapid increase in interest in monitoring the brain and also the red bars using TIVA. COVID reduced our anaesthetic throughput for a while, but I'm delighted to say that we're performing more TIVA and more processed EEG than ever before. And we're blessed with a plentiful supply of equipment. And yesterday, we released 250 new monitors and pumps with Eliveld's model for our consultants to use. Now, the UK has been very keen and enthusiastic in using TIVA. We produced these very helpful guidelines if you scan the QR codes, you'll be able to find these guidelines on the internet. SIVA and the Association of Anaesthetists released these uh, safe practice guidance, which is a practical guide to making your TIVA TCI anaesthetics safer. And on the right hand side, only 18 months ago, the Association of Anaesthetists released the standards for monitoring, which highly endorse the use of processed EEG monitoring during TIVA-based anaesthesia, certainly with neuromuscular blockade, recommended in TIVA without neuromuscular blockers, and also for the first time recommended for volatile-based anaesthesia as well. Now, the main bulk of what I want to talk to you about this evening is what do our processed EEG monitors measure, what anaesthesia looks like, how it affects the brain, and how we can interpret these monitors to gain ever more information. Now, when I'm talking about processed EEG, I am, of course, talking about these monitors. The older system on the market is the BIS. Then in the UK, we also have Massimo's Sedline and the NARC trend. You may have access to different systems, but these are the main systems which are approved for use in the UK. Let's think about some basic sciences. Where does the EEG originate from? Well, the pyramidal cells in the outer cortex of the brain, the outer six layers of the cortex, produce rhythmic uh, electrical signals in a range of different frequencies. The EEG is a summation of activity from many tens, if not millions, of, EE, of, um, of synapses underlying each EEG dot. When we're looking at the EEG, we talk about the frequency and the amplitude. With frequency, we divide the um, frequency into different terms. So the very slow frequencies, less than the hertz, delta frequencies, 
up to four hertz. And then depending on which book you read, there are different classifications. But the anaesthetist is most interested in frequencies below 30 hertz. That's high frequency beta and some gamma and below. When we talk about amplitude, or in fact power, this is how much of a particular frequency that we have. Typically, low frequency oscillations have very high amplitude and a great deal of power, whereas these high frequency oscillations are much smaller and have much less power. When you're looking at your monitor display of the raw EEG, we need to think about the axes. Across the x-axis, we have, the, uh, have time, which on a standard BIS Vista monitor, the signal takes 4.4 seconds to tra traverse the length of the screen. The amplitude, which is the up and down oscillation of the waveform, is plus or minus 50 microvolts. Now, when we're looking at the EEG, we need to remember this signal doesn't repeat in the same way that an ECG does. This is a stochastic signal. That means we need to think in terms of frequency and power rather than pure morphology, unless we're epileptologists. On this uh, EEG, I've highlighted a gentle up and down oscillation with the blue pen. If we count the number of cycles, we can see that there are one, two, three cycles. I've also, with these green arrows, highlighted these spiky oscillations. There are 50 of these green arrows, indicating 50 of these oscillations over this 4.4 second period. With some simple maths, we can work out what the dominant frequencies of this EEG actually are. There are 50 green arrows, divide that by time, 4.4 seconds. That gives us a frequency of 11.3 hertz. These are alpha oscillations. And the blue gentle underlying oscillation here, of which there are three cycles, divide that by 4.4, that's a delta oscillation. So this EEG is demonstrating an alpha delta pattern. Those are the dominant frequencies. And this is an EEG associated with propofol-based anesthesia or volatile at less than about 0.8 of a mac. This is an adequately anaesthetized brain. Now, every brain is a little bit different. Here on the left-hand side, a young patient having TIVA TCI-based anaesthesia, and on the right, an elderly patient's brain. This is a 70-year-old female having a laparotomy again under TIVA. Look at the difference in the height between these two EEGs. There's much less power in this older brain, although we can still see those undulations as well as those alpha oscillations, but they're much smaller. When we look at the BIS index numbers, the numbers are very similar. We're losing some of that rich qualitative information, which tells us the difference between our patient's brains. This elderly brain is much more likely to have post-operative delirium. We can look at that same uh, pattern to identify that both brains are adequately anaesthetized with a dominant alpha and delta pattern. Let's think for a moment about what our monitors are actually telling us with these index values. Well, I'm afraid to say that there is no such thing as a monitor of consciousness. The frontal EEG is not able to differentiate between the conscious and unconscious brain. Consciousness is an, is an incredibly complicated topic, and it's possible to be uh, conscious and respond to an isolated forearm test and respond to a command, but have no memory at all. So our monitors are perhaps better thought of as probability of recall monitors. Indeed, that's what the original BIS monitor was calibrated around. In a volunteer study, volunteers were exposed to isoflurane, midazolam, propofol at different levels to produce different index values. And whilst um, under the uh, drug-induced state, they were read a series of words and they were asked to remember those words. When they'd recovered, they were asked, what did you remember? And if they were able to quote the words uh, verbatim, that was evidence of explicit recall. If they could remember the words when they read a list, that was evidence of implicit recall. And it was found that with a BIS index value of 64 or below, 
95% of participants were unable to freely record or record with prompting any of those words, evidence of absence of recall. To prevent movement, which the team uh, of researchers called unconsciousness, of course, unconsciousness and movement are not the same thing, one needed a much lower BIS index value of around about 50. So let's think a little bit about our different drugs. So propofol, of course, works on the thalamus. The thalamus is, is like the router of your internet system at home. All information from the outside world, every sensory modality apart from smell passes through the thalamus. The thalamus is affected by propofol and slows down from usually oscillating at around about 30 to 50 hertz to actually oscillating at 8 to 12 hertz, an alpha oscillation. And this gate prevents signal transduction to the cortex and integration with consciousness. So with our propofol, we're working to prevent thalamic conduction as well as communication between different parts of the cortex. We can think about it looking at a road. This road has all lanes open, traffic rushing in all directions with freely without any speed limits. When we apply propofol, the road starts to slow down with a clearly visible speed limit. When the road is open, the thalamus can transmit information to the cerebral cortex and allow conscious integration of sensory stimulus. When the road is closed, propofol is administered, the thalamus works in burst mode at a much lower um, signal frequency, which is what we're seeing on the EEG with that dominant de alpha delta pattern. And we're disconnecting various different parts of the brain from communicating with each other. Now, when we induce anesthesia, we see changes which are very characteristic. This is an awake brain. Look how small the oscillations are. They are high frequency and low amplitude. Shortly after giving some propofol, we start to see the oscillations increase in height. This is very characteristic and is termed beta activation. The surface of the brain is becoming more active. With time, we start to see an undulation appearing. These are those delta oscillations I showed you earlier. And with loss of consciousness, these delta oscillations are enormous. Uh, this is a maximal amplitude delta oscillation called slow wave saturation. At this point, your patient will not be responsive. It's an excellent time to insert a laryngeal mask airway or perform intubation, providing your neuromuscular blocking drugs have worked. During maintenance of anesthesia, things settle down to that lovely alpha delta pattern that we saw a few moments ago. If anesthesia becomes too deep, we actually start to see ECG on the EEG trace, these regular little patterns on a very flat baseline. Remember that the ECG is a millivolt signal and the EEG is a microvolt signal, a thousand time difference in amplitude. Let me show you a little bit of video to show you how quickly this occurs. This is an 18 year old female having a rapid sequence induction for a laparoscopic appendicectomy with a TIVA TCI technique using Schneider's model. At the top, I'm gonna to play some video. And at the bottom, I've got a still, record, a still picture of the patient's awake brain to demonstrate the difference as things change. That's the beta activation, huge delta oscillations, and we're settling into a lovely alpha delta pattern. The amplitude is much, much higher uh, than you see in the awake brain, and the oscillations are much, much slower. Now, there has to be a better way of looking at this information than that, which can be a little bit confusing. So we can use a spectrogram, and many of the modern monitors will show you this. And this lovely colourful diagram shows us on the x-axis time and on the y-axis different frequencies. With the colour, the warmer yellows and reds showing much more of a particular frequency and the blues and purples showing us much less. So when we look at this picture, we can see we have a lot of delta frequency uh, activity, no theta activity, a lot of alpha activity, and nothing in those higher frequencies. And this picture is absolutely characteristic 
of propofol-based anesthesia in a young patient um, undergoing TIVA anesthesia. And I can tell all of that just from looking at the picture. Now, different drugs actually produce different frequencies. Imagine you're a pianist playing the piano. The drugs are locking you in to just playing the low notes as well as these alpha frequencies. If we're using a volatile-based anesthetic and we um, move over about 0.8 of a Mac, we start to see these theta oscillations. Suddenly you can play more of the keyboard than you could with propofol. These two pictures look very different, even though the raw EEG can look quite similar. Dexmedetomidine allows different frequencies depending on how much drug you give. Low dose dexmedetomidine looks much more like sleep with an alpha band appearing slightly higher frequency than propofol. Deeper dexmedetomidine sedation produces a stage two, stage three sleep type EEG, which is delta dominant, like this picture I've didn't demonstrated here. Ketamine is a strange drug, as I'm sure you've experienced as an excitatory drug, it produces high frequency oscillations, allowing you to play these very high notes. This causes the uh, EEG to accelerate, and our processed EEG monitors often get a little bit confused and start producing high index values. This is all because our drugs work in different places. Propofol working in the reticular activating system and the uh, uh, thalamus, as well as some activity in the cortex. Ketamine, low doses work in the cortex and higher doses start to take out our reticular activating system and induce um, as the anaesthetized state. There's also effect in the spinal cord. Opioids, particularly remifentanil, have a pronounced effect in the reticular activating system and in the insula, just outside of the thalamus. So when our patients are anaesthetized, we see a pattern very much like this. This is our propofol-based pattern, alpha and delta. When we stop the drugs, we see the effects on those alpha oscillations reduce and the brain starts to accelerate again before our patient arouses. When we increase propofol, we see that alpha band start to become increasingly faint. And with time and increased dosing, we'll see the delta band become very dark, the alpha band become very faint before we move towards birth suppression. So where does the evidence and the science for these patterns being consistent with anesthesia come from? Well, one of the pivotal papers came from Emory Brown's team at Massachusetts General Hospital, where they performed a series of experiments on volunteers undergoing ultra slow induction with propofol, taking around 45 minutes or so, with high resolution C, uh, MRI and high resolution EEG. What this patient's doing, this is their ability to press a button to indicate that they can hear a auditory stimulus. And this alternated between a click or a bleep and their name being spoken. The purple line is the concentration of propofol using Schneider's model. And as the concentration of propofol increased, they stopped pressing the button, becoming disconnected, their brain becoming disconnected from that auditory signal. At the same time as they started to become disconnected from those signals, so that alpha delta pattern that we've already spoken about started to appear. The other thing that became apparent was that both sides of the brain started to do exactly the same thing at the same time. Now, normally, both sides of your brain are working asynchronously, but under anesthesia, the concordance between the electrical activity between both sides of the frontal cortex exceeds 80%. The brain doing similar things on both sides because we've knocked the thalamus out and got it resonating at a much lower frequency. Other things you might see on the EEG, which are very reassuring of anesthesia, are alpha spindles. Slightly higher frequency than those alpha oscillations we've already talked about. They have a crescendo decrescendo morphology like this, like a diamond. Here's another one in an older patient. And this is very reassuring of that blockade of the thalamus. These are often seen during normal sleep as well. 
another feature that gives us an indication about how profoundly anaesthetized the brain is, is actually the phase relationships of these alpha oscillations superimposed on those slower delta oscillations. And what we're looking at here is the height at the top of a delta oscillation versus at the bottom. As a patient enters into a deep anaesthetized state, the height of these oscillations at the top of the delta is maximal. This is known as peak max. As a patient leaves an anaesthetized state and starts to regain consciousness, they go through a state where the oscillations are maximal towards the bottom of the delta oscillation, as in here. In both these cases, we can identify that the alpha oscillations are maximal at the top. Now, there's no monitor that shows us this, but it's a nice observation to make. Here's a little example in uh, bringing together all of those modalities we've already spoken about. This is a young patient, TIVA TCI-based anaesthetic. My histogram at the bottom, which is a Fourier transform of the EEG, is showing big peaks of delta and alpha activity in that raw EEG. And that's consistent with the pattern on that density spectral array. This is what propofol-based anaesthesia should look like. And I'm reassured that the patient is not going to generate new memories or have sensory integration of information. And that's what we need to be thinking about when we're delivering anaesthesia. We're not simply switching brains on and off. Now, of course, there's often two components to TIVA-based anaesthesia, so we ought to think about our anti-nociceptive drugs as well. Large doses of opiates cause the EEG to slow. This is because, as we've already mentioned, those opiates are working down in the brainstem, generating slow frequency activity at high doses. And of course, it's possible to induce anaesthesia with opiates on their own. Here's an older BIS monitor system, the BIS XP system, with a patient given remifentanil at a large dose, a microgram per kilogram uh, per mil per minute, a significant concentration. And when we look at this, we see the awake brain progressing into that very uh, delta dominant, slow wave saturated EEG. The numbers will be out of time with the raw EEG on the BIS because it does have significant processing delay. But we can see that this is an anaesthetized, profoundly anaesthetized brain with uh, brainstem inactivity, which is producing those very, very large delta oscillations. If you're lucky enough to have anti nociceptive monitoring, it's possible to try to optimize brain state. And here I've tried to do exactly that. I've been reduced my Remy fentanyl at this point, regaining that lovely alphabet, which is probably better for my patient's brain. Ketamine, as I already mentioned, throws us a bit of a curveball with its excitatory activity. You can see this yellow marker here and here, where I've administered a subhypnotic dose of ketamine, just 30 milligrams. Two minutes following administration of ketamine, you'll find the brain activity accelerating, producing higher frequencies around about 50 hertz that lasts for 50 to 45 minutes, depending on your patient's brain. There's been a fantastic paper in uh, anesthesia and analgesia demonstrating that brains unable to accelerate in this way are more likely to suffer post-operative recovery room delirium, almost like the brain has failed a test to demonstrate that it can respond to an excitatory drug. On this bottom picture, the white shaded area is demonstrating that ketamine effect, um, causing the acceleration before the effect of the ketamine wears off and we see the typical propofol alpha oscillations resume. So I think anesthesia is easy to recognize on our current monitors. We can use the density spectral array to demonstrate a strong alpha delta pattern consistent with propofol based anesthesia and an EEG again confirming that with our alpha and delta pattern. We don't need these numbers to tell us what we can see with our own eyes. I think the index values obscure valuable qualitative information about our patients' brains, and that those EEG states consistent with anesthesia are readily identifiable. The spectrograms I've shown you are an intuitive and easy way 
to visualize anesthesia with different drugs, uh, interventions that we use. And propofol and opiates, of course, interact and can be monitored and titrated independently. I think brain monitoring is simple, readily accessible, and very rewarding. And I would encourage you all to agree with me that monitoring the brain, the target organ of anesthesia, is a no-brainer. Here, I've got a QR code which will take you through to a recommended reading list and list of uh, presentations and uh, podcasts to give you more information about the future of anesthesia. I look forward to taking any questions from you and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that brilliant journey. And uh, I think uh, you it, it was very lucid and excellent proposition. And I think the spectroscopes are making things much more um, challenging or much more insightful to learn more about what an anesthetist have to know. Thanks for sharing those uh, superb notes with us. And uh, Mark, are you going to stay uh, for some more time to take the questions later? Yeah, yeah. I'll be around for the uh, Q&A, of course. Yeah, delighted Ex to hear the audience's thoughts. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, having uh, had an insight into uh, how uh, the brain sleeps and how different medications uh, affect the, uh, the neuronal tissues and also how age changes us, with that insight, now we may I request the next speaker, uh, the head and head of anesthesia and the OT management of Sakura World Hospital, Bangalore, Dr. Sishir Chandrasekhar, who had his previous appointment as a consultant pediatric anesthetist at Great Ormond Street Hospital, London, UK. He's a member of several professional bodies, and he's also a person who is extremely uh, interested in uh, pediatric anesthesia and also spends a lot of time on the measurements and improving quality in anesthesia practice. He's also very keen that uh, we need to teach people about non-technical skills training for anesthetists, excellent postgraduate teacher. And we look forward to hearing from you uh, how you use TIBA TCI in the pediatric age group. Is it safe? Do you do it routinely? Uh, is it comparable with the outcomes in adults? Uh, over to Dr. Sishir. Thank you very much, Dr. Balavankar, for those generous words of introduction. Am I both visible and audible? Very clear. Okay. Absolutely. Super. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I bring greetings from uh, Sakra World Hospital, Bangalore, where I work as a pediatric anesthetist and, as, uh, and also head the department uh, of anesthesia. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I hope to kind of cover these broad themes of TIVA in tiny tots. Why one should really be using TIVA in kids at all? If we are using it, how it's different from adult TIVA practice? What the real world advantages are of using TIVA? Or is it just one of those nice things to know, but you would never really use? And importantly, can we translate what is essentially a European developed technique into the Indian context, given our uh, certain resource constraints uh, that we may have? And finally, uh, like everything we do in pediatrics has to be safety oriented. Is TIVA a safe technique to use? And if yes, how? So these are some of the themes I would uh, wish to cover. First things first, uh, do we know how much TIVA is being used in India? The short answer is no. In fact, we do not have much data whether about either adult or pediatric practice, but it's reasonable to assume that it's likely to be very low. Um, so what I have done is just looked at some data from the UK, where it is a long established and accepted uh, technique, both in adults and kids. Uh, in 2008, Courtman et al. looked at 242 tertiary pediatric anesthetists and quizzed them about how often they use TIVA in their practice. And about one in four admitted to using it at least once a month. Fast forward that by about a decade, and a repeat survey of now 291, again, pediatric anesthetists so showed that almost one in two used it at least once a month. And about one in 12, which is about 8%, now use TIVA as their default technique in pediatrics. Uh, 
So the uh, what I'm trying to get at is that it is an evolving technique. It is a well-established technique in adults and increasingly becoming powerful course in, pe uh, in pediatrics. And I hope to convince you by the end of this talk that uh, it's a sensible option for all of us to consider too. Uh, just as a, uh, you know, to my, the scope of my pediatric uh, TIVA practice is I regularly use the, both the PED fuser and Cataria models in and outside of the operating room, typically, uh, you know, for uh, longish cases uh, on table, also in the GI suite. Uh, when I'm using it out of, uh, uh, you know, we have an anesthesia compatible machine, but if I didn't, MRI would be another obvious area that I would use it more. And even now I do use it regularly there. Neurosurgery too. When in the past I've not had a pump that was capable of doing pediatric TIVA, I've also used the manual steward regimen for uh, neurosurgery in a small baby that came for a, uh, to preserve the bulbar cavernosus reflex, for example, in a six-month-old baby. Uh, and uh, I would say as a routine, something between 20 and 25% of my pediatric practice is TIVA and probably 50% of my adult practice is TIVA. We all hope for a day when we don't have to really look at what the indications for TIVA are. TIVA is essentially an alternate philosophy of anesthesia. Every case, like Subhu was alluding to earlier, every case in which you use propofol for induction is also ripe for using TIVA as a maintenance technique. That said, there'll be postgraduates listening to this talk. So easy to and convenient to group them into three kinds of factors, patient-related factors, surgical factors, and also procedural factors. Where there is a proven or suspected history of malignant hyperthermia, where there is muscular dystrophy, where there's evidence of central core disease, it is a no-brainer. TIVA, this precludes the use of inhalational anesthetics, so TIVA becomes your default technique and the only really available safe technique for us. And this is also why the Royal College of Anesthetists, for instance, now call TIVA as part of your basic competency if you want to call yourself a qualified anesthetist. So these are what I would say hard and solid indications. Increasingly softer and more persuasive indications are coming up where uh, Kids with a known history of nausea and vomiting, those who have known to have had terrible emergence delirium, again, TIVA finds a role, TCI TIVA finds a role in them too. Uh, again, the way I think about TIVA is that you almost divorce the airway from anesthesia delivery. So that is exactly the philosophy of uh, TIVA, essentially. And so any shared airway work where airway surgery is happening, again, TIVA comes into its own, as it does when you're doing uh, neuromonitoring, where even half a mac of sevoflurane can mess with the signals and you will not be popular with your electrophysiologist should you be using either sevo or DES. Uh, other indications would be remote sites, especially if you're in a resource constrained uh, setting and also unknown uh, um, neuromuscular issues where muscle biopsies are being taken where you would want to avoid inhalational anesthesia. So what are the real world benefits of TIVA in kids? There are a whole host of things we could concentrate, but I thought for the purposes of brevity, we'll look at these four things and just explore them in a bit more detail. TIVA is well known to reduce the risk of post-operative vomiting. We don't use the word POENV so much in kids because nausea being a subjective component is often difficult to elicit. Uh, TIVA also reduces emergence delirium, like I alluded to, and as anesthetists, one of our big fears anesthetizing kids is the risk of laryngospasm, which is three to four times as much as it would be in an adult. And TIVA again finds a role. And here I'm talking classical TIVA of propofol and remifentanil. And acutely aware that Remy is not yet available in India, but soon will be. Remy is an excellent cough suppressant and is excellent uh, a combination to reduce the risk of laryngospasm too. And also often we are, you know, in shared airway work, a kid is having a MAC of one, the whole anesthetic team and the surgical team is probably having half a MAC themselves. So theater pollution is a big problem in pediatrics and TIVA gives you the option of having virtually no theater pollution. Looking at each of this in a bit more detail, uh, the incidence somewhere between one in 10 to one in three kids uh, end up with post-operative vomiting. And especially beyond the age of three, the incidence is twice as what you would expect in adults. And consequently, what we always recommend is two antiemetics prophylactically. We do know that volatiles are strongly associated with nausea vomiting in kiddies, especially nitrous oxide and sevoflurane. 
And this important study from Schaefer et al., now about five years old, showed, and this is an important point I want people to take away, that the TIVA alone is just as effective as giving a single antiemetic. So you typically you give dexamethasone and then some ondansetron. So just giving TIVA is just as uh, you know just as good with a very um, you know high efficacy as an antiemetic in itself. Obviously because of the effect of propofol and the avoidance of volatiles. There's no pediatric data, but the number needed to treat in adults is quite impressive. It's only 5.53. So for every five kids, uh, five adults uh, who you would give TIVA, one would not throw up, and that's a pretty compelling case to make in it. Anybody who looks after kids knows that uh, emergence delirium is a big problem and it does not uh, make uh, any make you friends with either the kid, the parents or the recovery staff. Somewhere between one in 10, one in two to one in 10 kids have emergence delirium of varying severity as they wake up uh, uh, from uh, volatile anesthetics. We all know that it's more common with sevoflurane. Isoflurane is an option, but it's increasingly in the availability of isoflurane becomes an issue. And the younger set of anesthetists have probably not grown up using isoflurane. So, uh, you know, it, it is a problem. Uh, data from Chandler's uh, study from about 10 years ago now showed that uh, if TIVA were used in kids uh, undergoing strabismus surgery, delirium was more than halved. So the kids who had a classic sevoflurane anesthesia, anesthesia had about a 38 uh, percent emergence delirium versus less than 15 percent when TIVA was used, which again gives an impressive number needed to treat of only 4.3. So this is again, especially in a kid with a proven history of emergence delirium, I would urge people to start considering the, uh, in a, the possibility of TIVA. Again, the commonest indication most pediatric anesthetists in the UK use sativa for is airway reactivity. So it's uh, like I was saying, uh, uh, Remy is an excellent cough suppressant and the combination of propofol and remifentanil is great if you have a higher risk of a kid uh, having a spasming or you know having a higher risk of uh, coughing as well. It also has a huge advantage of no pollution of the airway. It is probably better for those with a recent upper respiratory tract infection. As we know, airway reactivity continues to be high for between four and six weeks after a classic URTI. So again, anything that reduces the risk of that happening intuitively would seem a logical option. Also, a lot of kids come for repeat procedures, dynamic assessments of microlaryngobronchoscopy, and in that situation, the ability to maintain spontaneous ventilation and to titrate TIVA, uh, titrate the depth of anesthesia comes into its own, and TIVA finds an obvious use in this situation. So if it were that good, everyone should have been using it, but we are not. And what are the causes for that? obvious elephant in the room is the unavailability of remifentanil and that is what stopped me from using TIVA for, for the first few years after coming back but then I realized the analgesic arm can still be managed with boluses of fentanyl and morphine and that's what we do now. Remy is round the corner we are told and uh, it should be only a matter of time before it becomes available but that is one of the barriers to acceptance. We've till recently had a problem with procuring TCI pumps but now as I know there are at least four four or five manufacturers uh, selling their wares in India, so it should not be a problem anymore. Pain on injection is one of the problems we know with propofol and that we'll just discuss in a little bit. The big risk, again, people are scared of is propofol infusion syndrome. So I'll spend about a minute talking about that too. And also the risk of awareness, because we know we have MAC, which we kind of completely believe as the holy grail of death, which, which probably isn't, but we don't have anything like a MAC uh, for a TIVA. So that is one of the other fears, which is a fear of awareness. So how do we avoid pain on injection? The simple stuff, you tape your IV tubing, you hold the kid's hand, you reassure, have the parents in the anesthetic room, which is standard practice in my hospital now, uh, co-administering uh, preservative-free lignocaine somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5 mg per kg often helps because of its local anesthetic effect. Uh, choosing as large a vein as we can get is also a sensible option, as is pretreatment with opioids. Now, propofol infusion syndrome, this is one of the big fears why perhaps TCITVA has not really been really as accepted in pediatric practice. 
but it's very important to understand a few things. It has never, PRIS has never been reported from an operating room scenario. Where we have seen it is in a PICU setting where kids have had large infusion, somewhere between around four to six mg per kg per hour for about two days. So even however slow a surgeon we work with, we are unlikely to have to face 48 hours of anesthesia. So I don't think we should worry too much about PRIS. But when it does happen, it can be really problematic. It can be catastrophic, actually. It could uh, present with rhabdomyolysis, acidemia, and quickly progresses to multi-organ failure. So what are the ways we can try and reduce that from happening? One of the obvious things to do is to double your propofol load. So use 2%, and that's what we do in our hospital. So the lipid load is naturally halved when we use 2%, and that is an obvious thing that can be done in pediatrics too. Uh, we have to be careful in those with known lipid metabolism issues because this can really be a trigger for PRIS. And those kids with MRFs and MELAs, unlikely that we are going to encounter that on a daily basis, but those with mitochondrial myopathies, which are maternally inherited, in those you should uh, better avoid TIVA. Next, the big risk that people talk about is awareness. For people listening to this, uh, the NAP5 was a study done by the Royal College of uh, Anesthetists in 2013, I think it was, where they looked at 2.8 million general anesthetics in the UK. There were about 140 odd cases of awareness that were described, eight of which happened in kids. Of these 141, 18% involved TIVA. Only one of them was a kid. But the important thing, and I think both Shiv and Subbu alluded to earlier today, is the problem that was happening when they did a bit, you know, dug a bit deeper was this was because of fixed rate infusions that of propofol that were being run, typically either sending the kid to or from ICU or for a scan. But of course, TCI TIVA is not fixed rate infusion. It's bolus elimination transfer, the BET technique. So with that uh, being uh, you know used and also unnecessary use of relaxants if we can avoid. I don't think awareness is anymore. And of course, processed EEG like uh, Dr. Bali just uh, spoke uh, beautifully about just a while ago. So all of these things can reduce the risk of awareness under anesthesia with the TCI. A bit about pharmacokinetics and what it's different in the kids as opposed to adults. The V1 in a kid is about twice the size of an adult. So in a typical adult in a Schneider model, for example, V1 is calculated at only about 4.7 liters, almost the same as your plasma volume. But in a kid, your V1 is twice as much. And consequently, they need about a 50% higher initial bolus and 25% higher initial infusion rates. And that tailors down after a little while. So TCI regimens, again, come into their own to, uh, to make use of, to, to, to get around this problem. So what are the regimens that we have? I know Eleveld has just come. Eleveld is a one size, a kind of uh, pediatrics to geriatrics, all sizes, all shapes, all of that. But my experience, to be honest, has been mainly with Pedfuser and Kataria till this point. So I will just stick to that for the moment. Speed Fuser is the older of the two models. It's based on marsh pharmacokinetics. Uh, kid as uh, light as five kilos, you could use it as young as one year. And then Kataria is for a slightly older kid, 15 kilos and above, and three to 16 years in age. It's important to say that both of these are plasma TCI. So those of you who are observant have realized that there's a plasma TCI concept and an effect site. There is no effect site as yet described in kids, although Eleveld is now slowly coming there. But uh, for, for the purposes of general teaching, KEO, KE0 has not been described in kids. So both are plasma TCI regimens that we use. Another important concept to remember is the context-sensitive half time. So the time after which we term, turn off the infusion and the plasma levels fall to half is about twice as much as it is in adults. So in an adult, after a one-hour infusion, it would be around six minutes for the propofol to come down. In a kid, it's closer to about 11 minutes. After a four-hour infusion, as you can see, somewhere between about 10 minutes in an adult and about 20 minutes in a kid. So this is fine. We know this and we just need to make the corresponding changes. So next question comes, okay, I, do, I want to start using TIVA, but I don't have a TCI pump. What can I do about it? Luckily, manual regimens do exist. But the important thing to remember is naturally because of the three compartment pharmacokinetics being quite different to an adult, they will differ quite largely from adult regimens. The typical Bristol regimen is about a 1.5 mg per kg of bolus and then the 10 h 6 rule as Shiv again spoke about. The McFarlane is also target is a 
uh, regiment based on the uh, Kataria regiment. Uh, so again, three to 11 year old kids and by targeting three mics per mil. So what they recommend is 2.5 mg per kg instead of the 1.5 we would have given in an adult and then the 15, 13, 11, 10 uh, rule. So in higher initial uh, infusion rates, like I alluded to, so that the V1 is saturated and then the V2 and then the BET kicks in. So here, remember, we are aiming for three mics per mil. Even smaller kids, yes, it is still possible. And this is a regimen we have used at Sakra for a couple of uh, our cases. So again, as you can uh, clearly see, these are big, they sound like big doses initially. And every 10 minutes, you start slowly cranking it down. Uh, but it gives us something like three mics per mil concentration with this as well. Jillian Lauder in a uh, journal, uh, in an editorial in 2015 has suggested that TIVA will eventually supersede inhalational anesthesia, even in pediatric practice. So I think it behoves all of us to make an effort to learn this. I think this is the future of uh, anesthesia in more ways than one. So just to conclude, uh, I submit to you that TIVA in children is safe. It's effective, it's time tested. You're not doing something uh, you know, dark and dangerous when you're using it. Propofol alone isn't quite enough. So we have to combine it with good analgesia. We wait with bated breath for remifentanil. Till that comes, we make do with fentanyl and morphine and good multimodal analgesia. The real world pediatrics, you often need an inhalational induction. So that's no problem. I mean, even if you start with an inhalational induction, it's not a contraindication to TIVA. The, the caveat being you start your TCI at a lower rate. And because these are plasma models, you will not get a massive overshoot, but just build up your TCI concentration slowly. Processed EEG is definitely a useful adjunct and is recommended for all kids about the age of six months. And however, these are just pumps and they will just do what you ask them to do. So it is not a substitute for clinical judgment and we cannot rely just on the pump. With that, I thank you for your patient uh, high frequency, low amplitude way of hearing, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sushi, for this uh, passionate and wonderful uh, talk on uh, on how you use it in your pediatric patients. And thanks for sharing your own experience. And I think uh, with the, the new pumps that are coming in, uh, I think uh, at the level, I think uh, you'll be using it more and we'll be seeing more of that from you in the next webinar. But thanks for that excellent uh, exposition of uh, your uh, stint with uh, target controlled infusion in pediatric patients. Uh, next, we request uh, uh, Dr. Deeraj Masapu, the consultant neuroanesthesiologist currently working in uh, Sakura Ho World Hospital, Bangalore. He's uh, DM in neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care, uh, which he did from Nimans. And um, he's a reviewer for uh, Elsevier and uh, he's published more than 25 articles in the field of neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care. He's written a chapter and monograph of lumbar intrabody fusion, a topic of neuromonitoring in lumbar fusion surgeries. So, uh, I'm very happy that uh, a very dynamic, passionate uh, Dr. Deeraj Masapu is going to share with us uh, what he does uh, of using uh, TCI uh, and also conscious sedation in his neurosurgical procedures. Uh, over to Dr. Deeraj. So thank you, sir. And uh, can you, uh, am I audible and uh, visible? Yeah, yes. Yeah, you can see your slides okay. and you are audible. Yeah, thank you, sir. I would like to start with a video. Actually, the presentation by Dr. Mark Barley and uh, Dr. Shishir will facilitate my presentation. You will, uh, because now people have understood what is EEG and what is base and what are different depths of anesthesia from Mark Barley's presentation. And uh, now everyone knows what is Pete Fuser model, Kataria model after uh, Dr. Shishir's presentation. And let us, this is how my typical uh, case looks like. This is an SA navigation uh, we are using to identify the pedicle. So, and when uh, this goes on, I was running the patient on uh, TCI, 2.8 micrograms per ml. And uh, also we're running uh, dexmedinomidin and uh, I monitor EEG in all the patients. And appropriate depth has been, uh, this is called appropriate depth of anesthesia. So what I monitor is not base. What I really look at the raw EEG, and you can see the speculation frequency here. That is uh, 18. And we also monitor the top. 
uh, in these patients. And uh, you can see here that office, uh, we maintain the patients without relaxants. And uh, Let's say that, what is an L3? So, spinal cord tumor, uh, we are operating here. And I was running the patient on uh, TCA propofol and dexamethasone and infusion. So you can see here, motor work potentials have been monitored in this particular patient. So this patient, what I observed is uh, during the case, the patient was in uh, uh, two deep anesthesia. Patient was in a birth suppressive pattern. So. And you can see the birth suppression ratio is nearly 100%. So this is not the desired depth that we actually want in that particular case. Then what I did is I decreased the uh, TCA propofol and uh, dexamethasone also, but still the patient is in birth suppression, even with 3.6. This is another geriatric patient uh, whom I had done recently. He was having global hypokinesia. And uh, you can see the BIS was maintaining around uh, 37. Uh, that's a good... Uh, Decent depth, 36 base with a signal quality index of 97. This is what we desire, but at what MAC? At a very lesser MAC, uh, at a MAC of 0 0.4, I was able to achieve that. So why I showed all these three cases is, uh, so what happens is, uh, we really don't know how human brain works. Sometimes when you think that, uh, you know, this particular anesthetic is correct, then, uh, uh, you'd be overdosing, and when you think that uh, the drug is adequate, you'd be underdosing. So you need EEG monitoring that we understood actually by after uh, Mark Barley's presentation. So with this intro, I would like to start about the TY and uh, neurosurgical cases. So basically, brain and spine surgery is what uh, I would be talking about. So what are my main concerns uh, in neuroanesthesia? So during brain surgery, my main concern is to maintain a lax brain and facilitate neuro monitoring. So to, how do I achieve this? I would like to show with an example. So this is a right side intraventricular lesion uh, we have operated. And uh, during this case, a surgeon requested for a very lax brain because this is uh, located in the deeper part of the brain and he needs to split the brain rather than cutting the brain. So for this part of the surgery, I need to create lax brain. For that, what I used is along with manifold and the reverse insulin, I used catarium model. So with this model, I was able to achieve, uh, you know, lax brain because propofol is a cerebral vasoconstrictor and decreases the cerebral blood flow. And it has been proven in many studies. So this is how the brain will be when you use propofol. And neuromonitoring is what I would be focusing in this presentation. So in neuromonitoring, we usually do for uh, motor and speech areas. So preoperatively, the tumor is located near the motor and speech areas. We would be doing neuromonitoring. In this present, in these cases also, we would be uh, doing the cases on total intravenous anesthesia and we would be avoiding muscle relaxants. So what we uh, really monitor uh, is the corticospinal tract that you can see here. And uh, when you use uh, inhalations, what happens is in the dorsal horn level, the inhalations will suppress the signal transmission. So this is where uh, the difference comes between uh, propofol TCI and inhalation when you're actually monitoring the motor evoke potentials. So sevoflurin will have a suppressive effect. So this is a case of a motor mapping that we were doing. So we identify the different areas of the brain. Here I identified the hand area, and we try to uh, enter, we try avoiding that area when, when we are entering the brain. So that is about motor mapping. So uh, in CP angle uh, surgeries, what we monitor is uh, we monitor the facial now. And even for these surgeries, we have to maintain the patients on uh, total intravenous anesthesia with TCA propofol. And we need to avoid muscle relaxants during the procedure. And uh, it has been proven that the amplitude of motor evoc potentials and other uh, uh, mirror monitoring procedures are superior with TIVA techniques. And uh, nowadays, we started monitoring something called as uh, D-wave monitoring during uh, uh, spinal cord tumor surgeries. 
So even for this wave monitoring, we need to uh, run total intravenous anesthesia. For minimal invasive spine surgeries, you can see this video. Please stimulate, stimulate with 7 milliampere. 7 milliampere. Yeah. So this particular case, what happened is yeah. the uh, uh, screw was very near to the nerve root and uh, we had to redirect the screw. And even for these kind of cases, we have to run the patients on TIVA without muscle relaxants. So pediatric nerve surgery also uh, requires TIVA. So these are the cases. So this is a case of uh, dethetering and hemivertebral excision. So here we monitor MEP and also we do triggered EMG and uh, we try to do you know, triggered EMG monitoring. For even for these cases, we monitor the patients with total intermittent anesthesia. So this is the interesting part for vascular surgery. So carotid endotectomies, what do we do? So what we do is, uh, for these cases, uh, when uh, we remove the plaque, we have to clamp the carotid. So when we are clamping the carotid, uh, the blood supply to that part of the brain will be decreased. So it would be surviving from the blood from the collateral flow. So during that point, so how do we actually make sure that brain is surviving? So for that, what we do is uh, we monitor something called as somatosensory evoke potential monitoring from that part of the brain. So do, even uh, for these surgeries, we have to maintain the patients on total intravenous uh, anesthesia. So, so this is how we do the carotid endotrectomy surgeries under general anesthesia. In, uh, when you're monitoring SSCP waves, you can actually uh, use uh, muscle relaxants. Awake intubations we commonly use in uh, cervical surgeries where uh, critical stenosis is there. So awake intubation, awake position is what we do. So you can see in this video, uh, I use a TCA propofol, uh, just 1 to 1.5, just to keep, uh, keep the patient comfortable. So we, we can do awake intubation with the airway blocks and then keep the patient on uh, TCA propofol. So the patient will be obeying and we can position the patient awake with TCA propofol. Even awake craniotomy, uh, we can use uh, TCI propofol. And uh, the advantage for awake craniotomy is that you'll exactly uh, have the decrement time in the machine so you'll know when the patient is going to be awake. So this is a pediatric patient. So I was doing this case with uh, awake craniotomy. This is the awake craniotomy because so I was doing a TCI propofol. And then uh, scoliosis surgeries, so I add ketamine because in the prospect guideline, they're suggesting uh, addition of ketamine to propofol. So we add ketamine. You can see this is how we run uh, the uh, scoliosis. Ketamine, propofol, and the phenylephrine also are going on for this particular patient. And uh, vertebral plasties, uh, usually we do under sedation in our hospital. So here, what we do is we run the patients on uh, ECI propofol and uh, high flow oxygen will be used. So this is how vertebral plastic procedures we do. So take home points with are the, the uh, better brain laxity is there with Tativa and uh, facilitation of uh, uh, neuro monitoring is there, uh, which is uh, so Tativa is the only option for us. And for awake intubations, also we use and pediatric neurosurgery, it can be safely used. And uh, in awake craniotomies, also we started using because the decrement time actually helps us in knowing when the patients will be awake when we stop propofol. And uh, we do not use only in epilepsy surgeries because. Uh, Propofol can suppress the epileptic spikes uh, during the electrocorticography recording. So another uh, video I would like to show. So this is the case of uh, scoliosis surgery. The patient is very deep. Burst suppression is going on in this particular patient. So this is not the depth that we actually desire. So here I was running around 4.5 micrograms per ml of PCI and ketamine of 9. So maybe uh, this... So at this point, what should be done? Well, we should decrease the depth at this uh, situation. Another case I would like to show you on a spine surgery. So propofol 5.5 uh, micrograms per ml was going on. Dexam, dexmeridamine also was going on, no inhalation. And uh, so this particular patient, when uh, I assessed, his, so hemodynamics is stable. 5.5 TCA is supposed to be very high dose. Motor work potentials are coming. But the patient was actually in a very uh, lighter depth or, you know, just, uh, you know, not very deep actually. So there is every possibility of bucking and you know, this kind of uh, EG pattern. So here, why, why I'm showing these things is, uh, 
So we, we actually with the uh, experience of so many cases of PY and EEG monitoring, now I came to the conclusion that I really don't know which patient is reacting in which way. So sometimes I feel I see a G-react. Today I did an issue for maybe 80-year patient. So that patient with a TCA 4.5, his bis is, uh, you know, his EEG is showing that he is lighter. So usually we expect that, you know, with a, uh, you know, PCF 4.5, you would be in birth suppression, but it's not like that. Every every person is different. So right now uh, I use EEG or BIS for most of my cases. And we thought that uh, I really don't know how the NSH is mm-hmm. going on. So that is a conclusion I made after uh, having the experience of many cases. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Deeraj. Uh, very exciting to see um, the progress that has been made in safe conduct of neuroanesthesia, uh, neurosurgery and the neuroanesthesia and the spine surgery is excellent. And uh, I think uh, over a period of time, as you rightly mentioned, that there is so much of variation that is happening between uh, individual to individual. So possibly, I think uh, we'll have pharmacogenetic studies, uh, pharmaco, um, uh, uh, the, the genetic component, the g- pharmacogenomics, uh, which probably will get integrated and probably like doing a biopsy, buccal biopsy, we'll get it done to see uh, how we are going to alter the way we are going to um, uh, take care of that particular patient. And I think uh, the last few minutes uh, will be uh, before we go for the question answer session. I know that we are crossed 11 o'clock, but then um, this is the last component. And uh, because many people, even in the chat box, the questions have been asked whether it is economical uh, to use uh, the total intravenous uh, anesthesia. And especially this would be a question which uh, several of uh, the administrators would ask us. So to share uh, his thoughts, Dr. Sushit, can you let us know about the economics of TIVA? Thank you, Dr. Bala. Again, uh, no problems with the uh, slides or voice? Both okay? No, no both are fine. So, yeah. Thank you. I'll try and keep this uh, short and snappy. Uh, So basically, uh, what I want to just uh, look at today is this is a question that is often asked. TIVA and TCI, not only in India, but also in the UK, has uh, traditionally been thought of as a very expensive technique. A lot of it was because uh, the drug uh, propofol was still under uh, patent and they had these special chip uh, devices called the dip refuser, which you had to only use those glass syringes, which you then had to put back, put into their own pumps. And so consequently, uh, because they were a monopoly, costs were extremely high. But that ceased a long time ago, because once propofol became generic, uh, cost was less of an issue. Now, remifentanil is becoming generic. But still, the fact is that it's thought of as an expensive technique. So I just thought I'll just share some of my thoughts about it, especially in the Indian context, because you know not every Everything in westwards is easily uh, translatable into our practice. So we will look at two things. We look at what the cost of running TCI Tiva in an Indian setup is. And we will also look at what the tangible and intangible costs of not running a TIVA, which basically only other option we have is volatile anesthetics. And this, again, is very topical. We know there's a lot of press. And again, there is I have no conflict of interest to declare. I About 50% of my practice is TCI TIVA. Other 50% I use the volatile anesthetics. So while I'm in an enthusiastic proponent of TIVA for almost 20 years, I'm by no means an evangel- uh, you know, evangelical about it. So just some costs in the Indian context. Anybody running a department will know costs come in two types. So one is the CapEx, which is the capital expenditure, and then the operational expenditure, or called also called the OPEX. A TCI-compatible pump does not cost as much as uh, we think. It's somewhere between 80000 and a lakh and a half. And for Mark, if he's listening, that's somewhere between uh, you know 800 pounds to 1,500 pounds. So that's about it. So that is not very expensive. And if you are... Uh, you know, good with your negotiation. A lot of the existing pumps, these are essentially soft, software upgrades. So although the reps may not like my saying it, it is possible to convert existing pumps into TCI capable pumps. Or even if you had to buy it, it definitely does not cost uh, the earth as it were. Uh, 
Now, coming to the operational expense, we I just looked at the 2% propofol that we use, a 50 ml, and I've just looked at the rat rate. So I don't know what the hospital buys it at, and I don't want to get into that aspect of uh, things. So this is what is billed to the patient. Uh, a 50 ml ampule of two, a vial of 2% propofol costs about 900 rupees, which means every mil of propofol is about 20 bucks, 20 rupees. So typically uh, kept, uh, you know, targeting of about three mics per ml, if you think of of, uh, Chris uh, Roberts regimen at 10 mg per kg per hour, this equates to about 700 rupees an hour. And this might happen for the first few minutes, first 15 minutes perhaps. And then you back off to something like eight or six mg per kg per hour. So somewhere between 420 rupees an hour and 560 rupees an hour is your propofol cost. Now, remember this is, I'm talking just about propofol. Uh, Remifentanil is not yet in the market. We don't know what it's going to be priced at. And this talk may have to be revisited once that comes. But the rest of the anesthetic remains the same, whether you run Tiva or you run Volatile. So your analgesics and all the other paraphernalia of anesthetic drugs and uh, adjuvants will cost the same regardless of the technique. So the number I want you to remember is somewhere between 400 and 500 rupees an hour is all that it costs for the propofol. And of course, some small money you have to add about syringe and, uh, you know, the drip sets and all that, but that's, that's a few rupees, doesn't cost you much. Now, how does that compare to volatile anesthetics? Again, like how you need a syringe driver to run uh, propofol, we all know we need a vaporizer to run uh, uh, you know, any volatile anesthetic. And the vaporizer cost at the very least is about a lakh and a half. And perhaps a bit more, definitely for the Tech 7s and the Desflurin vaporizers cost even more. You could then argue that many hospitals, actually the companies leave your vaporizer in the hospital and then just, just make you buy the drug, which is again, uh, it is true that, that uh, so you may not have a capital expenditure, but should you want to buy it, it costs at least as much as a pump does. Now, I, in preparing for this talk, I checked what the rate of sevoflurane in India is uh, by two companies that, uh, you know, roughly the cost is much the same. Sevoflurane costs about 29 rupees a mil, 240 ml uh, uh, bottle costs about 8,000 rupees. Sevoflurane costs about 9,500 rupees for 240 ml, and that equates to about 39 rupees per mil. And I asked my uh, billing guys in my hospital what it is that they charge. And for sevoflurane, they tell me they charge 30 ml an hour, and that multiplied by 29 comes to 870. Remember what we said, somewhere between 400 and 500 was uh, uh, the propofol cost. So this is 870. Desflurane uh, naturally is one third as potent, so you'll end up using a lot more. And my hospital and several hospitals in the area I have I work in bill them at 50 mils an hour. So that's about almost 2,000 rupees an hour, but four times as expensive as uh, uh, propofol. So at the very least, we can say that uh, TCITVA is cost neutral in our setup when you compare to the two classically used volatile anesthetics. But we are men and women of science. I'm not going to be you know, dictated to by what my billing guy tells me. So I just did a bit of uh, simple maths. One mil of uh, sevoflurane eventually produces 184 mils of vapor. We know that. And assuming a one mac setting and even two liters a minute, which I think is a reasonable flow rate, I know there are people using low and ultra low flow rates, but I would say the average Indian anesthesi anesthesiologist probably uses two liters a minute or maybe even more. And at that, you, uh, you end up needing at least 13 and a half mils of sevoflurane an hour. And that equates to about 390, 400 rupees. So much the same as propofol. If on the other hand, you're using desflurane, each ml of the liquid desflurane produces about 210 mils of vapor. And assuming a 6% or 1 max setting, and again, 2 liter flows, I know des we should be using at very low flow rates. And this will make you realize we should not be using 2 liters a minute of des because that is seriously expensive. It's something like 1,300 rupees an hour if you're using 2 liter flows of 1 max setting of desflurane. But Oscar Wilde said this a long time ago, and I think it's becoming particularly topical now, that people know the price of everything these days and the value of nothing. So this is where I think the other 
The second aspect of my talk comes in, what about the intangible costs of not using uh, TIVA? Scotland has already banned desflurane. Uh, you, uh, England, NHS England, I think from 2024, Mark will correct me if I'm wrong. From 2024, they are getting desflurane off the racks. The back bars no longer have desflurane vaporizers unless you actively seek it. Now, without getting into the politics and everything of it, we will stick to what the reality is. So this is the greenhouse gas emission that happens globally. 82% of the greenhouse gases is because of carbon dioxide. A large part of it is due to methane. But you'll see that little uh, number there of nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases of anesth uh, that anesthetic agent. As a percentage, it's still very small, but it is a percentage that's on the rise because every year we pass, the rest of this starts coming down and this keeps going up. So nitrous oxide, for those of us who are still using nitrous oxide, I would urge us to really reconsider. I frankly feel uh, maybe controversial, but I feel it's a technique of the past. It's a drug of the past, and we are probably causing a lot more harm than we realize. Again, uh, this slight uh, semantic difference, I mean, it's not semantic, it's actual difference between uh, what a greenhouse gas is and what an ozone depleter is. All the anesthetic uh, uh, inhalational agents are greenhouse gases, but SIVO and desflurane are not ozone depleters, so they're exclusively fluorinated. They do not deplete the ozone layer, so let us not give it you know, undeservingly bad press either. But halothane, isoflurane, and nitrous oxide are ozone depleters and greenhouse gases. However, whatever drug we use, whether you have scavenging or not, uh, all you're doing is scavenging is just scavenging it out back into the atmosphere. And what do we think happens to this gas that goes into the atmosphere? All of these nitrous oxide lives on long after the patient and the anesthetist have since departed the earth. It hangs around in the atmosphere for 114 years. These are quite impressive numbers when you think about it. It's, it doesn't go anywhere. It just goes higher and higher up, but it stays very much with us. Desflurane, if you're using somewhere between 10 and 20 years, sevoflurane, bit about you know, somewhere between one and a half to five years, depending on which uh, quote. So it hangs around for years. So basically, it's a cumulative effect that is uh, you're going to leave for a 20 minute anesthetic. You've used something and then that hangs around in uh, the atmosphere for 114 years. Is it a risk worth taking? Is it something as responsible people we should be doing? I think we should all introspect. Just final couple of slides. Uh, one is about just a simple uh, context. If you think about every hour of anesthesia, when you're using fresh gas, uh, fresh gas flows of somewhere between half a liter and two liters, with desflurane, it, it, the global warming potential is said to be the same as driving something between 300 and 470 miles every hour of desflurane anesthesia. Every hour of sevoflurane anesthesia is something is driving the same global warming potential of driving 18 miles. And when you think about this at a global level, in 2015 alone, there were about 250 million anesthetic procedures that were done. And that is only going to go up and up and up. Our world population is now about 8 billion and rising. So just imagine the burden of anesthesia, burden of surgery will only increase. And uh, when you look at that initial pie chart, everything else is going down. And is it reasonable for us to keep on increasing when we have other options? And important to say that propofol has only 1% of the global warming potential of sevoflurane, but it's not without its own problems. We need to see how we are going to safely dispose of the propofol, what to do with all the horrendous amount of plastic packaging that comes with it as well. But again, just food for thought. And I'll just end this talk by flipping the topic on its head and saying the economics of TIVA, can we afford not to use it? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that uh, in-depth analysis of the economics and some uh, brilliant quotes about uh, what happens uh, when we use inhalational agents versus intravenous anesthetic agents. Uh, I'm seeing uh, the, the watch. And uh, so I think um, uh, one question which has come in, which I thought, uh, I think Mark was trying to answer that. Uh, the question was uh, whether we could use TIVA TCI uh, without monitoring uh, the BIS, uh, because uh, in many places uh, it is uh, expensive and cannot be used. So is there a way to do it? Uh, yes. So 
Well, for a start, if you wanted to use a BIS monitor, you don't have to use Medtronic's sensors. There are third-party sensors available from uh, manufactured in China, which are much cheaper, and some British hospitals use those. There are other systems, such as the Narcotrend system, which just uses normal ECG dots. So, for an example, I it costs me um, fifteen pounds in the UK to use a BIS monitor. It costs me 15 pence to use a Narcotrend monitor. It's 100 times cheaper because it just uses simple ECG electrodes rather than the fancy strip. So otherwise, how can we calibrate our patients to our propofol dose? Well, we have to do that clinically. So um, as you're delivering propofol through a, a TCI system, gradually increasing the dose, when the patient becomes unresponsive, that doesn't mean they're unconscious, but um, apply a jaw thrust and see if the patient responds. At the point they don't respond anymore, have a look at your pump and see what the effect site concentration or the plasma concentration is. And think of that as some form of baseline below which you won't go. The patient might be a little bit over anaesthetized because we're not able to monitor the brain, but that will at least give you an indication that they're not responding to a maximal stimulus. So thank you so much, Mark. And there's one question which uh, I think any panelist can take it because this is a basic question. I think uh, they're not using Tiva TCI. They just wanted to know when you use Tiva TCI, is an anesthesia machine needed? Dr. Sishir, you want to take it? Yeah. Or... I mean, yes. We, I mean, any anesthetist is only as good as their plan B. So I think definitely an anesthetic machine is needed. The standards of monitoring should not change. And the worst case scenario, especially when you're learning, uh, you know, Tiva, something fails, a pump fails, you always have to have a backup option of going back to what you know to do well. Yes, it may mean um, that you know increasingly sophisticated um, uh, machines may not be as much necessary in the sense that you may not have to go down to very low flows or metabolic flows. You may not need the same level of tightness in the circuit, but definitely the recommendation is the same standard of anesthetic care should be observed, whether intravenous or inhalational anesthesia. So there's uh, just a question come in. Uh, what are the experiences regarding myoclonus uh, with the use of propofol? Um, any panelist uh, could take this question? Uh, no, uh, yeah, yes, Dr. Sibu. Um, now, sir, uh, generally what I've noticed is if you have adequately premedicated, for example, if you have given your uh, uh, fentanyl a little bit, bit before and waited for it to work and then start your induction. Uh, uh, if you go step five, you do see, but that doesn't seem to be affecting either. Uh, the patient will not remember. The myoclonus has not been so severe as you suddenly pump it. Uh, yeah, there's a... Um, Dr. Sushi, there's a question. Carbon footprint of Tiva... 20 ml, 50 ml syringe, pressure tubing, one-way valve, all plastics, and electricity for pump. Uh, so how do we take this into consideration? Yes, I mean, we definitely have to take that into consideration, try and make it, you know, there's a, a move towards green OTs and environmentally conscious and environmentally aware, and we are still st taking baby steps. But so for example, uh, when you look at global warming potential, well, what it defines is one ton of a particular uh, uh, you know, drug uh, gas versus carbon dioxide. For something like desflurane, it's something like two and a half thousand times as much global warming potential as carbon dioxide. And for propofol, it is about 1% of that. So we are, you know, we're talking huge differences, but yes, that is not to say we need to ignore these aspects. We need to get more eco-friendly, more, the, you know, yeah, that's a valid point. A quick question during ketofol anesthesia, which is better, ketamine first or propofol first? Uh, do we take EEG into consideration uh, in this scenario? Mark, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly can do. I think um, the headache you have, I mean, I don't do ketofol as in mixing my ketamine with my propofol. However, when I do use ketamine, I use it a lot. I think it's important to find a time during the operation 
where you've got a stable surgical stimulus and a stable infusion of propofol. Then you know that any change in your process EEG index value or in the EEG waveform is related only to propofol, uh, only to the administration of ketamine, sorry, and isn't related to the patient becoming aroused or lightly anaesthetized. And of course, as I mentioned in the talk, you'll see that arousal, um, that acceleration in the EEG oscillations occurring about two minutes after administration of, of, of your ketamine. If you are running ketofol, you can see over time a gradual drifting up of your index value and a gradual increase in the frequency of that alpha band on the density spectral array. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I think um, we had an excellent session, a lot of insights, different kinds, pediatrics, neurosurgery, and how to set up a pump. So there were a lot of uh, uh, insights. So just before we conclude, may I request every speaker to say one concluding remark on what they feel about this uh, TRTCI. Uh, we shall start with Dr. Subbu. Uh, uh, I think um, this, is, uh, this is a very, very important that everyone should get trained, should learn, should start to use it. Do you need it for every case? You may not, but uh, certainly, certainly the percentage of cases where you are going to use it uh, will increase and uh, it is important to learn under people who have used it, to use it very safely. I wish everyone gets under that uh, and uh, learns it from people who have used it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shivkumar? Uh, your audio is, uh, I think you're muted. Ash. Sorry. Um, yeah. uh, okay. I'm audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the de uh, the delegates first practice uh, TCA for a sedation. Suppose if you are given a regional anesthesia, then practice for a sedation, then go for a ASA one, ASA two cases. That rather than going for a ASA three and four patients. Thus, uh, my advice for a uh, novice uh, practitioner in TCA and avoid a uh, fixed dose. Uh, regimens that's my practice start using at least for a, a sedation purpose yeah thank you so much uh, dr mark hello uh, dr mark uh, yes hello um so two things start using tiva with cases you know really well if you do a lot of uh, uh, laparoscopic work or or paediatric work, whatever it might be, work within what you're used to doing and choose a simple case first of all. And take your time titrating up the propofol and observing the clinical effect of your patient. My second point would be to, whenever you can, monitor the brain. Volatile, neuromuscular blocker, no neuromuscular blocker, monitor the brain. For too long, anaesthetists have forgotten that the target organ of anesthesia is the brain, and we really should be monitoring it in the 21st century. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mark. I think that was uh, a clear message of uh, where we need to focus. Uh, Dr. Sashir? Uh, I think uh, we need to appreciate that it is an alternate philosophy of anesthesia. And consequently, the learning curve starts from the same point for even experienced anesthetists. It is not like transitioning from isoflurane to sevoflurane to DES. They were all essentially the same drug and minor adjustments were only needed to learn it. Whereas philo uh, the philosophy of TCI-TY is different. So I might request to even senior anesthetists is to learn it properly from somebody who has done it a lot and also appreciate the nuances of three compartment pharmacokinetics before uh, diving headlong into it. Second thing, the biggest advantage of TIVA, as I see, is the ability to divorce the airway from anesthesia delivery. And consequently, when we start thinking about that, you will find more creative uses for it. Thank you so much. Uh, Dheeraj? So uh, my concluding point would be, uh, there is a learning curve in uh, T TCI and TIVA. So it is more like, uh, uh, so... <clears throat> So what I feel is uh, you need to use uh, you know BIS monitoring and depth of anesthesia monitoring, and uh, uh, then I think it would be a good combination. 
So we're building up one. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dheeraj and uh, uh, Dr. Tushar. Uh, you have any concluding remarks uh, before we close? Uh, it was a very nice and superb session. So thank you all of uh, joining today's TCA Tiva webinar. It has been excellent session filled with the valuable insights and knowledge sharing. We hope that you find this webinar informative, all of us. And very much thank you for Mark Barley from UK and all the speakers. And thank you, Dr. Bala Venkat and my other other host. So we will meet again. Remember to stay, stay connected and uh, wishing you all success in your future endeavor until you start your TCI at your practice. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think uh, world gets uh, divided into people who use TIVA TCI and the percentage of uh, those who are using TIVA TCI will be on the rise. And this webinar, I think it gave a lot of insights into why they should start one. And uh, thank you so much for all the panelists for their uh, insights. Thanks to Dr. Sunil Pandya for the introduction. Uh, and thanks to Okart for giving us the platform and Anesthesia TV for telecasting it through the TV. Look forward to meeting you all again. And thank you so much. And good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Bala. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Good night. Good night.